In this extended episode of another Zelda podcast, David meets with Alex Sheehan in Chicago to talk about all of the interesting people they met at the Midwest Gaming Classic 2019. Hello and welcome to another Zelda podcast. I am David Geisler, your co-host here today. Today, I almost said tonight. We are recording during the day right now. I am not with my co-host, my regular co-host, Kate May, but I am with my sometimes co-host or at least special one guest. One time. Yeah, yeah. One back, time co-host. One time. Well, it, feel, it feels Alex, Alex Sheen is here with me. Alex, welcome back to the show. Thank you. <laughs> um, you were a special guest last season, but the reason I think I kind of stumbled there and said co-host is because I really feel like we are co-host in this this show. Um, you joined me at the Midwest Gaming Classic for the Another Zelda Podcast booth, mm-hmm. and we definitely kind of, I would say we both were responsible for the interviews. You conducted some interviews, I conducted some interviews. It was definitely a co-experience. Yes. So, honorary co-host... Alex Sheehan. Spiritual co-host. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Yeah. This has been a heck of an episode. <laughs> this I mean, is a big episode. It's uh, it's what? We're clocking in just under two and a half hours of content coming your way. <laughs> like for Saturday. Yeah. I spoke with John for about an hour a couple days ago. Um, I think I might... I think, I don't know, I think I might for our Sunday episode actually do a little interview with my nieces who joined us. But we'll get to that, we'll get well, to that. Well, we did perform, perform, do you perform? No, you conduct interviews. We did conduct <laughs> a few interviews with them and they conducted a few interviews with some of the other... Mm-hmm. Only uh, reality attendees. television performs interviews. Yes, that's oh, mm-hmm. good angle. Wow, that's. Um, I think we nailed it. We got the episode. <laughs> We're that's done. All we need. We're done. So, Alex, Alex yes, uh, th- this is this is essentially part two of our Midwest Gaming Classic episode or episodes. Um, I've titled this one Saturday because I just want to do kind of an audio audio documentary of our day and our experience. Now, um, <clears throat> I've already talked to our audience about how another Zelda podcast going to the Midwest Gaming Classic, what it was like, what those adventures were like. Um, it was not a last minute thing, but we were signing some paperwork right at the last minute. And um, I compared and contrasted to the video game summit a little bit on my episode with John, just the one just before this. So our listeners know all of that already. So let's skip right to Saturday morning. Yeah. Saturday morning, the booth had already been set up. John mm-hmm. and I set it up the day before. For me, I, I think you drove in from Madison that morning. I believe that's right. To yeah. join us. I had the magical uh, task of showing up mm-hmm. and sitting around. <laughs> <laughs> what? Just man, the, being a person in the booth. That's it. Oh, I didn't yes, really yes, have to yes. do the setup. I didn't have to do any of the organizational things. Oh. I just showed up and played Zelda and talked to kids. And Fair enough. Well, we did need another body in the booth, and I do appreciate it. And you were more than just a body because you did help me co-produce this with as far as conducting the interviews, which we didn't initially plan, I think. No, I think we, we kind of had like a, a living room feel to it, but it was pretty free-flowing. We decided, okay, let's just capture a few sound bites. Let's... Well, yeah, if I may, I think I think what we knew was I knew I needed another person in the booth, and and because we had signed up for the Midwest Gaming Classic a little bit later than maybe one would normally do. For example, next year we'll have this thing planned out. Almost you know months from now we'll start right. planning for next year. And for example, Kate May was not able to attend the video game summit last she was year in New York. Uh, she had like Canada? a family camping trip, Something? and it was. I we... prefer exact coordinates. I'd like to dox your co-host. <laughs> And so this year, she also had a family event and, and couldn't be there. And so I, I did scramble a little bit, even though I had intentions of inviting anybody in the Another Zelda podcast family to the Midwest Gaming Classic. I reached out to the people who are writing our blogs, mm-hmm. uh, Lizzie, Celeste, and Shane. And, uh, they Shane, all said no. They, well, yeah, <laughs> Celeste lives in like New Orleans or Louisiana, pardon me. And um, uh, Lizzie was up in Madison. She couldn't do it. She had something going on with her husband. And Shane gave us a, a soft yes. He's like, I think I can get down there, but I have a family event. I said, no worries, no worries. I'll call, you know, I'll call in the pro and I texted you. Oh, okay. Because we've been podcasting we've, for decades, you, you said and I. It. Yes, yes. I knew course. that it would be good. I knew I, I'd be in good hands. I, I prefer not to be the first asked anyway. <laughs> I want there to be a little bit of desperation in the ask. Because yeah. then I have all the leverage. Well, I'm going to say yes, you know, I'm going to say yes. But <laughs> I just kind of like a little bit of um, an upper hand in these things. Indeed, indeed. I certainly wasn't trying to imply that you were a second ask or anything like that. No, you flat out said I was the fourth. <laughs> so that's fine. <laughs> it's great. It's cool. 
I think, um, yeah, anyway, I don't have to justify it. We've been, <laughs> we've been making shows for decades, you and I, and uh, you are very involved with John and I with this formation of 6-5 and all of that. And so um, maybe I was trying to go more towards AZP, AZP people first. But then what was nice about that is because you've also been a producer of podcasts. Once we got into the booth and started conducting interviews, we knew we were going to do interviews. Mm-hmm. But I think it was unspoken, but I think we thought like, okay, Alex will man the booth and Dave will conduct the interviews and we'll go from there. Well, lo and behold, our very first interview, it was a gentleman that you started chatting with out on the, out on the hallway, out in the aisle, I guess. Right. And you kind of brought him over to me and was, and you were kind of like, Hey Dave, how about, uh, uh, Hey, here's, here's a guy we've been chatting. Would you like to interview him? And I realized in that second, in that split second that I was like, wait a second, Alex knows how to interview people. Alex has been doing that for years as well. He knows this gentleman's story better than I do. I don't want to have to re-ask this gentleman everything that right. they yeah. just talked about. And I think like just right in the moment, I said, do you want to do it? I've known the guy for a whole 30 minutes. Of course I want to do it. <laughs> Not even 30. This is, um, I believe, so this is Ethan, right? This is the guy with the uh, the Zelda ring. Yeah, I believe so. That was so. our first interview of the day. Yeah, it was a pretty cool interview. He came over, we talked... I, I, I knew we'd get some video game fans, and I knew we'd get Zelda fans, but this first one, I think, was like maybe the biggest Zelda fan of the day. It could be. He had a ton of Majora's Mask uh, opinions. He had his wedding ring was um, engraved with like a Triforce and a Hylian shield and a, some other stuff. Oh, we have a photo of this. Maybe yeah. we'll tweet it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some uh, boomerangs. Oh, really? I mean, we're a multimedia company here, Dave. So I I would love to um, reminisce a little bit more about getting there that morning and all of that. I think it started to snow and crazy stuff like that. Parking was a little hard to find. Uh, But you got there. We got to the booth. May I indulge myself for a second here and ask? This um, is a family show. As you (laughs) showed up, I think that was the first time you ever saw the booth, a booth which I was very proud of. The first time I saw the booth, I saw a sketch of the booth. Loved the sketch. We <laughs> painted a great picture. I kind of knew what I was getting into a little bit, but we I walked into the uh, the room. There's there's a couple rooms. One was like a, a pinball room with a bunch of pinball machines yep. set up. There was one that was the main showroom for all the vendors. Um, another Zelda podcast was there. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you walk in, even though AZP was way in the back <laughs> of this huge football field-sized room, it was just this monolith that stood towering <laughs> over everything else in the building. And I could just see, it was like uh, a North Star guiding me. We, and so you saw it as soon I as you walked it. in? Oh, I'm so it. happy it about that. Over the Jurassic Park Jeep, over the Ghostbusters thing, <laughs> over the people selling all the fake, uh, you know, guns from all the video games, mm-hmm. the game gears for $100. Yep. I walked right past. I knew where I was going. I didn't oh, need I a map. Mm-hmm. Didn't need my handheld. I saw another Zelda podcast shining in the distance (laughs) like a beacon you know and and John and I did speak about this a little bit in our Friday episode no it was like 40 feet tall (laughs) maybe not 40 feet tall but it was like I think I think John said it was probably a a solid 15 but for a booth that's only 10 feet wide it was taller than it was wide and we spoke about that in the previous episode a bit but um and I've already gushed about how proud I was of the booth and how much it surprised me because it was really John who orchestrated that um but yes, it, it is true that as we were building it on Friday, I'll recap very briefly. We didn't initially plan for the booth to be actually that tall. We figured it'd be 10 by 10 by 10 or something. And then we got there and we realized the room was so big and we had the opportunity to make the wall in the back. We, we pushed it up about three feet and we made the screen a little higher and we realized we could pull that off. And then there was initially a plan to put the banner on the front of the booth, but it didn't quite work because of the way the projector had to right, be mounted. Right, right. So then we just had a moment where we were like, Do we put the banner on top of the wall? We build, baby. Oh my gosh, it was up so high. And it was super cool that you could see it from all over the place. Yeah, yeah. It was was great. Um, It was a nice little loungy kind of place to hang out. The the only instance of a standard conference banner, vinyl printed, it was, it's nice. The only instance I've ever seen where it kind of like was the cherry on the Sundae. It was, it was just kind of like, it just really classed up the concept of the conference banner. We didn't need the booth, babes. We didn't need anything else. We had that nice banner on oh top goodness. of our 15-foot monolith of a booth. It's true. It's true. I, you know, I will I will admit, on Friday night, I stayed in Milwaukee Friday night. So mm-hmm. I, I stayed at a friend's house and then did a little bit of running around in the morning. Oh, I thought you talking about Saturday night. And I was like, no, no, no Friday we, night. we stayed together in a hotel. Oh, yeah, I was yeah, there, yeah. Dave. It we, was great. We stayed together in a very scary hotel. <laughs> it wasn't. So scary. It smelled like a hospital. So you know it was clean. I was, I got us a hotel, just a quick, I was like, I just need an efficient hotel at the end. Cause we had to stay, you know, for the, for Sunday, I guess we're jumping forward just a little bit. And I just found a hotel out by the airport that was very inexpensive. 
and uh, it looked fine from the photos, but Listen, oh I my gosh. I smelled zero mold. I saw zero cockroaches. <laughs> there might, I don't know. I, I don't know. I cannot speak to if there were or were not cockroaches in that building. Oh, there definitely were. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying there were no cockroaches. There were definitely cockroaches, probably oh a goodness. rat or two, but I didn't see any. <laughs> and so they either sufficiently uh, plugged all the holes to the room so that they couldn't get in, or they have very... Decent, considerate cockroaches. I remember uh, as we were going to bed, uh, you were like, well, I'm just going to put a second layer of clothes on before I get in bed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know the slickness is there. I just don't want to feel the slickness on my on my skin. I hear you. I hear you. Anyways, I, I digress. So I, I, I uh, on Friday morning, I d- did a little bit of running around because we had ordered some postcards to be printed out, some signs to be made and stuff like that. But that Friday night, I, um, I didn't leave till like 11. I have to... I don't know if I should really confess this or not, but we got done setting up the booth around eight mm-hmm. and I just kind of had like, I can't believe I'm going to talk about this. I kind of had like a moment, like an hour and a half long moment, but I kind of just had a moment because it was so much work to get there and I'm so proud of Zelda and I'm so proud of 6.5, but but to just ha- have that booth look so amazing and have it all come together and to be at the Midwest Gaming Classic, something that has been a personal goal for me for years and I've never had the right means. I've always been a fan. And I just had this moment where I was like, you know, I think we're making moves. I think yeah. we're like, you know, we're in some pretty good company too, because some of the booths right around us were like well-known podcasts. Yes, or, it's true. Uh, uh, magazine editors and blog it's absolutely editors right. And all that. I was a little starstruck, and I was just so happy to be there that I kind of didn't want to leave. And finally, at like eleven o'clock, other people that had been setting up their booths, they were leaving. They were leaving. I was like, okay, okay, I should all go. Right. So know. anyway, I went. It was a. I had a little moment. I had a little way to catch my breath after a month of hard work, and it was really, really special. So then that morning, we get in. Okay, fine. We hit the ground running. We have this gentleman. Uh, we started. The show floor opens up, and it was busy immediately. Right. Yep. On Even Saturday. before so, because uh, they had, uh, I think, like an early bird access thing where yeah, right. some some conference goers could go early, and even that first group of people that weren't the main group, it was still a, a significant number of people. Yep. I think our first, maybe our first couple interviews came from that group. I agree. So let's let's go back. Let's go full circle back to our gentleman uh, Ethan here, who I didn't actually speak to too much. So I'm kind of excited to listen to this interview. I um. I know I talked to him. I don't really remember what we talked about. So th- well, this full is what's nice about this yeah. kind of show so is that um, we're going to be listening in real time with the audience. Yes, we will be. We will be. I have the audio files queued up here, and we'll, we will be listening to them. And it's, it's. I think our audience knows it's been about a month since the event. Right. I was hoping to record this maybe two or three weeks ago, but um, for reasons of, 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 of work and stuff like that, your job, I think you, you were in New York here for about two weeks. And so the second you got back, I was like, Alex, let's get together. So thank you. We're actually... We're actually meeting in a mutual friend's apartment. We sure are. Today we, we could uh we could even consider him kind of like a host. Has he hosted things? No. Oh, um, he's hosting us here yeah, right now. Yeah, he's hosting us here. He's not in the building. Mm-hmm. He's on the Eastern Sea board. But. Indeed, indeed. So we're in a very lovely apartment down in Chicago right now. And very luxe. South Loop, yeah, Chicago, nice. down the street from a fantastic a Mexican loft place. That we're in right now. Books. Um tall ceilings, some B board. On Indeed. The, on the ceiling. So, thank you very much to John for letting us do this here yeah. today. Let's do it. Interview. Let's do it. The last episode I did that Zelda podcast fans may remember was our top tens. Sure. And one of the top tens on that episode was Z targeting was invented by Ocarina of Time. Yes, it was. And how, how did that, that that affected video games forever? Past that point, I, and it still does. It's amazing. I mean, even with your third person uh, shooters nowadays or your third person action games. You know, Z targeting is still in effect where you hold the trigger button to kind of zoom in and, you know, hone in on your target. So yeah. it, it really was a game changer for 3D gaming for the Zelda franchise itself. You know, there are some people who say, well, I, I'm more of the 2D style and that's all well and good. But man, the 3D Zelda games. Yep. I mean, and the way I feel about that too is like there's, um, there's sort of a renaissance in indie gaming and 8 bit gaming and the like 2D platformers and all that. And that's all awesome. I think really great games. Yeah. Uh, are in that style. Yeah. But whenever you've got a like a triple A title that's 3D and fully immersive and huge and whatever, even if it's not your cup of tea, you gotta support it because that's what pays for the development of all the smaller games. And it just lifts the entire industry up. Right, right. Um, not to mention they're beautiful and immersive and the stories are pushed forward by by these games as d- different modes of storytelling. Sure. Right. We talked earlier about how Link to the Past was sort of one of the deeper dives into lore and story. Oh yeah, in, I think in the that's Zelda the franchise. First, that that is the first game where you got lore on Hyrule and the universe itself. Zelda one and two had a you know kind of just a 
cookie cutter story of you're the hero who has to save the princess, right? There wasn't much about yeah. Hyrule, not much about the uh, gods, the goddesses themselves. Yep. You knew the Triforce was this, uh, you know, ultimate power to be attained, but that was pretty much this it. big pig you had to shoot with an arrow at right, the end, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. but links to the past, you know, they go into the sages having to seal up this darkness, and uh, you know, the, just the various interactions with the different townspeople who are impacted by, uh, yep. you know, both in the light world and the dark world of Link to the Past. And yeah. then it just it just escalated from there until you got to Ocarina of Time, where you had the split timelines, right. which wasn't even really a confirmed thing, I think, I think until Wind Waker release. Sure. Uh, there were there were uh, theories, but, like, when you came to Wind Waker, that's when you start to, started to realize, all right, I don't think everything is just one storyline yeah. you know and so but it's fun to think too like part of the uh, so um, Game of Thrones coming out this Sunday uh, one of my favorite parts of Game of Thrones is not so much the watching of the episodes as it is discussing yeah and theorizing and yeah. uh, getting into the lore and I think Zelda, there's there's a deep well of that in Zelda and I think yeah. it's really great and another game that I, I saw you have a tattoo of Majora's Mask oh man that that just like raises so many questions and theories yeah. and everything what's, what's your top three theories in the Zelda universe let's start with Majora's Mask, because I know you got to have some. Well, I don't. So there's a theory that Link is dead yeah. for Majora's Mask. I don't subscribe to that theory. Okay. Um, I just, I don't. I think I don't think it really went that way. I think it's just a matter of Link going on his adventure. Because at the end of Ocarina of Time, you see Navi kind of go off on her own now, right? She's yep. she's completed her goal cast uh, cast upon her by the Deku Tree, and uh, she uh, separates from Link. So now Link having completed his mission is now trying to find Navi because that was his one and only friend right. other than Soraya yeah. who he has come to grips that he's never going to see her again because she's now a sage and, and so, okay the, the second question mm-hmm. did the sages die in Ocarina or did um, they just become sages think, and they live I, on a medallion I, I think so I don't think they're uh, living in the physical realm Right. Yep. Uh, they are living in the uh, the spiritual realm. Interesting. Uh, so I, I don't think that as an adult, where Link succeeds his mission, he can't interact with these people. And right. you see evidence of that in Ocarina of Time, because when you're an adult, you can't find any of the sages in the open world. Right. Exactly. They're, they're not there. Yes. So I think it's very very safe to say that they have indeed died in the physical realm. Yeah, yeah. So there was um, um, a theory brought up, um, I think the last episode, well, I don't know when this will be released, but the uh, episode about cooking different recipes, they talked about um, one theory is that to become a sage, you die in the physical realm and you live in the spirit realm yeah. uh, as a sage. The other is you have a second death as a sage when mm-hmm. they release all their power against Ganon in the end. Uh do you also die a second time as a sage? And are these people truly gone forever? Because you see it even in like in the end credits, you see some sad characters whose companions became sages. Yeah. Maybe they're no longer in existence anymore. So to answer your question, it, can you die a second time as a sage? Uh, yes, you can. You see that in Twilight Princess. Sure. When Ganondorf is being uh, condemned to the Twilight Realm, you see him kill one of the sages, and yeah. then they're dead. Yep. And you see the sages actively mourn the loss of this companion. So not only have they died as a regular person or being to become a sage, now they've died again as a sage against the evil of Ganondorf. Yep. At that point, they had to seal him in the Twilight Realm. Like, you know, you look through each game, you know, because you have where Ganon's sealed by the sages, you have him where he's defeated by Link, you have him where he's not defeated, and he runs rampant yeah. on the world, and then that's kind of where the sages... Well, Breath at the, of the Wild is right, where he runs exactly. rampant on the world for 100 years. So Breath of the Wild now... Um, how did you feel about Breath of the Wild? I thought... Um, Overall, as a game, you know, in terms of narrative, Overall gameplay. Overall, as a game, I think it's a great game. Okay. I think it'll be an even better Zelda game if they augment it with some of the more traditional puzzles and temples. Yeah. Uh, those types of mechanics. The one thing I wish they did have was an inventory system that you could repair. Yeah. Because yeah. I think the one anxiety inducing thing in Breath of the Wild is that Your I don't want to use all break. these cool weapons because they're going to break. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah. And that's an entire new episode. Thanks, thanks again to John. Uh, you'll find him on Discord and us on Discord. And uh, have fun at the con. I appreciate speak, speaking to you fellow nerds. Absolutely. Um, That's what we're all here for at the and, Midwest uh, Gaming Classic. <laughs> and uh, I, I hope you all have a, a great day. Yeah. All right. Cool, man. So you called him John and I called him Ethan. I wonder who is correct. I think I think Ethan is our next interview, actually, in my notes here. Interesting. I think I, I made a mistake here and did not... I have in points of where all the audio bi- sound bites are. Right. And since John was our first interview, I think I did not mark him, I must say. Ah, okay. So, 
Right. So our, I, list, I mean, of, on me. our <laughs> list of interviews starts at the 14 minute mark. Right. Was John zero through 14? Correct. Oh, or well, he was in there. Yeah, yeah. There's a little there. bit of dead space, but yeah. Right, that was sure, a, sure. So if I may, though, so with John, that was a deep dive right off the bat, Alex. Our first interview, and you guys oh. had your own little personal podcast. Yeah, and I was sweating because this guy goes deep on Zelda knowledge, and I, <laughs> I like it. I'm enthusiastic about Zelda, but man, I'm just glad that I didn't sound like too much like a sweaty tryhard. <laughs> nope, no, you got it. It's okay. Oh. It's okay. I think I like I so like stressful. some of your thoughts about um, how the, your your critiques on Breath of the Wild. I think are quite on point. Yeah, and I think later uh, later in this episode of the Sunday episode, you'll hear we do get an interview with someone who does not like Breath of the Wild. Yeah, I think that might be today. I think that's at the end of the uh, interview or yes. at the end of our episode today, towards the end. So, so we'll get more hot takes. We have like. 15 interviews to get through here. I say let's just keep let's at it, okay? Keep them rolling. So, yeah, we have a lot of interviews. Let's let's just go right into the next one. So, this next uh per- so Ethan, now actual Ethan. Actual Ethan. <laughs> actual Ethan uh was at our booth and he was playing the games and he was trying to do some of the shortcuts that can happen in the right. SNES game and the NES game. Yes. Um well in The Legend of Zelda and A Link to the Past. Oh, I did want to say one thing about your interview with John. I think John did bring up a good point. You know um that Kate and I, we, boy, is it, we're just having a little hard time with A Link to the Past. We we get it. We love it. We love Same all Zelda me. games, but the hook is not setting for right. some reason for us. Um, but I, I have to acknowledge that John is absolutely right when he was saying that was the first one that really started bringing a larger story in, really introduced the sages. When you compare A Link to the Past to The Adventure of Link and The Legend of Zelda, oh my gosh, I'm sure that when people played that for the first time, it was completely epic. Absolutely. I, I think the, the problem with Kate and I by accident is that we're coming off of Twilight Princess and Breath of the Wild and going back into A Link to the Past, and it's like, yeah, it's fine. It's good. Right, yeah. That's you know? a cool uh, cool Game Boy Zelda. Oh, no, it's Super Nintendo. Oh. A little bit. Yeah. And so I have to remind myself to give A Link to the Past more respect. Right. So anyway, so uh, Ethan here talks about um, a little bit about A Link to the Past and a little bit about The Legend of Zelda. Let's take a listen. <laughs> So I am here with Ethan. Ethan, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. This is our first time at the Midwest Gaming Classic. I'm really, really? excited for us to be here. I've been here uh, two years ago. I meant yeah. to come last year, but I was busy. Plus, the roads were horrible. If you fair saw. enough. Did you ever come before they were in the Wisconsin Center when it used to be the tent out there? Yep, there was a tent before. Yeah. that's where I would used to go. And it was uh, big then, but it certainly has grown, hasn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, it has. I had to wait like I think 20 minutes in the line just to get in. Oh, today? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's just a long line. I see. I see. What's it like down there? What's the experience like? Well, you know, you just kind of show up and there's just a mess of people. And uh, you just kind of have to figure out where the line is and <laughs> hope that you didn't cut anyone and then just go from there. And I then see. The rest of it is pretty simple. The line does move pretty fast. There's just a lot of people. Are you here for any particular reason today? Like you're looking for a certain game or something? Uh, I was actually here for a couple of pickups. Yeah. Um, just because I haven't picked up anything in a while. And, uh... Other than that, not really. Uh, I just kind of wanted to be here for fun. That's cool. So um, we were, we, I guess you could say, met each other because you swung by the booth here Mm -hmm. and you were working on a glitch on the original Nintendo, which we have, or original Legend of Zelda, which we have running, and also A Link to the Past, which we have running. Mm -hmm. Which I think I just messed that one up. I don't remember that one as well. It looked like it was working, honestly. Yeah, like the glitch itself was working. I just forgot the path to Ganon. So for our listeners, um, some may not be familiar with this because our listeners are everything from hardcore Zelda fans to casual fans. Can you explain what the glitch is on the Super Nintendo game? Uh, That one is called the Walk Through Walls glitch, Mm -hmm. and you can do it five minutes into the game, and there's other weird crazy glitches that you can do for any percent for speedrunning, but the way it works is that you get into the first room of the castle. So yeah. not the underground section, the first room. You go up to the top where the pots are, and you jump off and pause in midair and save and quit. This puts Link in a weird state. Right. Uh, Link is kind of hovering off the ground, but the game doesn't show you that. If I may, I, the because the Super Nintendo Zelda is one of the only Zeldas where each screen has two layers to it. Yes. And I think this kind of exploits that a bit, isn't that right? Yeah, you're technically in the middle layer, so that's yeah. why the game is confused. Now, in this state, uh, if you get hit, you can start walking through certain walls and stuff. So, for speedrunning, originally, you would go to the next room off to the left, get hit, and then walk up, and there's a path that you have to take. It's a really simple path. I believe it's only one turn, and then the rest of it is just holding up, but Interesting. I forgot it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, because the screen went black, and then uh, yeah. I think after the fact, then you realize, oh, you're in like a dark room with, yeah. where the sprites weren't quite right, but you I understand. You should be able to see your way all the way through. I was at the, we were at the Video Game Summit 
18 in Chicago um, last year, mm -hmm. and there was a person there that was trying to do it, and they were running on original cartridge at that show. Yeah. And I actually did see, um, at, if you make it all the way, you get to Gannon's room, and then there's another weird glitch where the rain is still triggered, mm -hmm. so then it rains through the credits and, and the stuff like credits, that. it's all rainy and thundery and it's yeah. weird. That's interesting. So then also you were working on a glitch on the original The Legend of Zelda yeah. game as well, which we have running. This one is kind of hard to explain, and I'm not good at doing it anyway, okay. so I probably just failed it. <laughs> but uh, what you have to do is you have to perfectly stop Link 12 pixels away from one of the edges hmm. of the screen where you would transition to the next, then turn around and press A all at the exact same frame for one frame. And if you do that, I don't know why, but he gets put in a weird state and you can walk through the screen and do a uh, screen wrap, which can basically warp you places if you do it right, yeah. which is used in speedrunning, especially for like swordless speedrunning because That's cool. it's very dangerous in that game. And I wonder why sword, the 12 pixels. Is it? Is it because that's like one row of column of sprites or something? I, I think it's because of like just data values and map yeah, values. The way it scrolls left to right or something, yeah. huh? Interesting, very interesting. That's what I think it is. So, so um, if I if I may, you're here for plenty of reasons today, but I'm ha so happy you stopped by the booth. Yeah. Uh, we're kind of just for the fun of it asking everybody what their favorite Zelda game is. Do you have a favorite? Oh, uh, that'd probably be Wind Waker, the original one, Ooh, though. Ooh, cool. The first one on the SD one. I know yeah. Wind Waker HD is great. I love that game to death. Yeah. But I don't know. I like playing it with a GameCube controller on a GameCube it with is real nice. hardware on a CRT. Like an idiot. <laughs> no, no, no. I love it myself. Uh, Wind Waker is a great one. And I do, I, I think the GameCube controller is fantastic. Of course it is. You it's know, like one of the best Nintendo controllers out there currently. I think it's one of the best controllers ever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, some people love, it's a little love it or hate it. Some people yeah. are like, that's the worst controller. The buttons are shaped weird. I think the, the weird shape in the buttons is perfect because every button feels different on your yeah. thumb. The, um, I did play the Wind Waker HD recently. And the only thing that was kind of nice was to have the um, camera controls not inverted. Oh, yeah. You know, because back in the early 2000s, everything mm -hmm. was inverted, so we were used to it. Yeah. But now everything isn't. So to go back onto that Wind Waker in GameCube, I keep swinging my camera the wrong direction. <laughs> I don't know. So for you, it's Wind Waker. That's cool. How do you feel about Twilight Princess? I like Twilight Princess. Yep. I've never actually beaten Twilight Princess, but I got sure. close. I just kind of stopped caring. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. it. That's a longer game. I asked because technically Twilight Princess and Wind Waker run the same engine, believe it or not. Really? Yeah. I'm not surprised, actually. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the controls are very similar. Camera's similar and stuff like that. Cool, dude. Well, thank you so much for stopping by and chatting. Yeah. I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you for having me. So that was uh, my interview with Ethan. Quickly. You know, I have never... I'm sorry, I stepped on your line. No, I was just bringing this back oh, in. What's this up? is the problem. It's unscripted. It's too loosey-goosey, free-flowing. I was thinking... That's our that's our season three subtext. Instead of instead of another Zelda podcast, it's a secret to everybody. Another Zelda podcast, too loosey-goosey. Too loosey-goosey. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that, I think it's good be, branding. That, it's, it's, uh, it's a good subtitle for a podcast. It's a good microbrew name. It could be a lot of things. <laughs> I think um, he might be the first person... I don't want to misgender him, but I think he's a he, right? We can go with he. Oh, Ethan, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think Ethan that identified he, as a he. he um, he's the first person I've ever met. I didn't really talk to him. Met uh, that liked Wind Waker the most. Well, maybe it was his first game that he played. I'm not sure. It could be. And the first half of Wind Waker does start strong. It does. It starts strong. Right, 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 right. You, you have know. that cool monster in the forest. Yeah, the monster in the forest, and yeah, even the, grandma, the first couple, up through the first couple dungeons, you're jumping around on the islands. You're, there's a pretty good plot with Tetra. Mm -hmm. you're, you feel like you're starting to build things right, up, right, and then right. it just kind of, it really kind of just frays away. Oh, that reminds me. I want to uh, correct myself. I said temples in the first interview. I meant Ouch. dungeons. Ouch. Um, I don't want any ats. A temple can be a dungeon, but a dungeon isn't a temple. Yeah. Or swap it. Anyway, Even who, do we have, it wrong. who do we have next, Dave? So I have Evil Jim next. I spoke to, he. yep, this gentleman went by Evil Jim. I asked okay. him his name and he said, I'm Evil Jim. And uh, that's what he goes by online. And uh, he spoke to me a little bit about kind of just gaming in the olden days. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff here. Let's, let's bring it up. Okay, so your name is? Evil Jim is how I'm known. Evil Jim on, uh, on the internet, I overheard as we were getting set up here. Pretty much. Uh, so what, where did that come from, if I may? Oh, that's a long story in and of itself. And <laughs> it's not as interesting as probably what you can come up with. I see. We'll leave the mystery there, huh? We'll leave exactly. the mystery. Fantastic. Is it is Evil Jim, if I may, connected to like a Twitch stream or a Twitter <laughs> account or something, or is that? No, not really. Yeah, cool. There's more than one of us, so good luck finding me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, Evil Jim, uh, you're uh, here at the Midwest Gaming Classic, and uh, we saw you 
playing a Zelda game out in front of our booth here. We've got a couple of them up and running, and um, I said, hey, you want to talk about Zelda a little bit? And, and if I may, you're like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> and uh, to that point, is there a Zelda game that you have in your memory that is a favorite game of yours that you cherish the most? Because there's 20 of them now. Mm -hmm. Well, hands down, that would be the original Legend of Zelda. Yeah. I grew up with that one. It was uh, very popular in my family. Oh, in, in the whole family. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, Friday nights, my mom would rent a uh, Nintendo game for me. We'd pick one out at the local grocery store, and one weekend, it happened to be The Legend of Zelda. I played it. My parents played it. We all loved it. My mom ended up giving it to my dad for Christmas later there that year. There it is. We each had our own file, and we shared secrets. We filled in the map that came with the instruction manual. I still have that laminated somewhere. It's oh my gosh, that's that's amazing. Mm -hmm. oh, you know, that was that was one of the cool things about the first Legend of Zelda. I also recall it from from childhood. Um, it had so many it, for the time. It had so many secrets to it that you almost had to talk about the game with other people. Yeah, it was all about exploration and discovery, and it was very unique at the time. I think Nintendo wasn't even sure if it did take on very well in the United States, but naturally it did. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It was, and I, we were, do, we did a little bit of research in our, we're in our second season of this show, but in the first season we did an episode where we did a bit of research on the making of that original Legend of Zelda, and we discovered that it actually started as just kind of like a dungeon crawler game. They didn't even have the overworld, and then one day, one of the designers kind of designed a courtyard to, to one of the dungeons, and they had to create a new tile set for that. And then all of a sudden they were like, well, wait a second. If we're going to make bushes, maybe we make an entire outdoor area too. And then the whole game changed. And that's when it really became, I think, the adventure element really came into play, if I may. That's really cool. I didn't know about that. I was I was fascinated to learn that. I think, um, I think that there's a lot of roots in that original Zelda game. Is this your first time at the Midwest Gaming Classic? Oh, no. This is... I've been going for over 10 years now. Awesome. So you went to it even back when it was, like, in the tent out there in the out by the Brookfield or whatever? And... Oh, yeah. So this is, like, the third location since I've been coming. Oh, this is only the second that I'm aware of. I think in 2007, 2008, my first times were uh, at a much smaller hotel. And Interesting. It's grown so much. What are some of your favorite things about the Midwest Gaming Classic in general? Pinball. It, <laughs> it, it was... It was the original one that I, the first one I went to where I just finally had a chance to play pinball as much as I want without it being expensive because it's all set to free play. Yes. And I ended up spending like almost eight hours the first day playing pinball. My shoulders hurt, my feet hurt, but it felt great. And I've been hooked ever since. And then, of course, all the classic games and then the vendor's room with all the treasures there that you might not have seen anywhere else. So. Yeah, the vendor thing is cool, but I tell you, like, specifically this year, Stern has an amazing setup over there. I, I, I'm sure you've seen that they've got a structure, they have a tent, they have a whole thing happening. Oh, yeah, I've already played the new Black Knight game and the Charlie, or Willy Wonka game, and oh. looking forward to waiting in line for all the other new ones. I'm jealous, I'm jealous. That's cool. So there's lines lined up over there right now to play the games? Oh, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. I mean, we we went in there at, like, as soon as it opened and there were lines, so it's they're only going to get longer throughout the day. It's true. Maybe Maybe, maybe if it gets a little slower on Sunday, I'll try to jump over there or something as it's a little lower. But yeah, good luck. You're probably tied to the booth for most of the con. Right? I have a, I have an extra person coming for help on Sunday, so hopefully that'll work out for me. But anyway. Oh, good. Um, well, uh, thank you, Evil Jim, very much. Thank you for uh, your thoughts on Zelda and even the Midwest Gaming Classic. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It was fun yeah. talking about my, one of my favorite games. Yeah, yeah, All cool. Excellent. I hope you have a great day. You too. So, um, yeah, so that extra person ended up being my both of my nieces came and helped us on Sunday. And so, like I said, I think I might have a little chat like you and I are having right now with them for our Sunday episode. I think that could be a fun uh, change of pace a little bit for these episodes. So, uh, yeah, Evil Jim, playing the, old, playing the old NES games. Now, Alex, you may or may not recall the two gentlemen that we'll be interviewing next. Oh, you got so excited you started slapping your microphone. Well, right? I had a, a joke queued up, but, you know. But the, I kept talking. You kept talking. You can fine. go back to it. We can, like, pretend. You want to play like the last two seconds of that interview again, <laughs> just real quick? Where I seriously? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Sure. Zelda and even the Midwest Gaming Classic. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It was fun yeah. talking about my, one of my favorite games. Yeah. Yeah. All cool. Excellent. I hope you have a great day. You too. He didn't seem very evil to me. 
<laughs> oh, I'm glad we rewound for that one, Alex. So, uh, yes, let's skip to uh, Eric and Zach. Do you remember Eric and Zach? Uh, Eric was, I believe, the gentleman that I recognized. I, I had, uh, he was a patron yes. at a bar that I used to work yes. at in Milwaukee yes, yes, yes. years ago. Both of these guys were deep into like the randomization uh, Twitch yeah. stuff that's happening. And I learned things. Maybe yep. you learned things. Maybe you knew a little bit more about it. Let's just get right into this. Basically, all four of us were chatting. You, myself, Zach, and Eric. So we ended up, I think I sat down with Zach and you ended up sitting down with Eric. And we just took it from there. So I'm just going to go, I'm just going to play both of these right in a row. Boom, okay? boom, boom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I am here with Zach. Hi. <laughs> hey, Zach, how you doing? Uh, pretty good. Uh, so um, you stopped by the booth here at our booth at Midwest Gaming Classic. Yep. It's, it's our first time at the event. Oh, We're cool. very excited. Well, my first time also, so. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a little bit about that. What uh, what made you come this year, if I may? Um, well, basically, like, I live in East Troy, which is too far. Um, my friend lives downtown. We were, like, we were bored, and I've, I've heard good things about uh, the Midwest Gaming Classic, so I yeah. wanted to go at some point, and good way to send, spend a Saturday. Say, let's go for it. Yeah. You're here just for the day, then? Yeah, just for the day. Got it. Cool. Are you uh, an avid collector, or is it kind of just more for the experience today? More for the experience. If I do like find something, I like a game that I might not have, I might pick it up, but more just for the experience. I hear you. I'm, I'm kind of similar, to be yeah. honest. Though there are some really cool collector things here today. Yeah, there, there Speaking are. of weird, cool <laughs> things, we got to chatting with you out in front of the booth about something that I didn't know existed, and I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't know, but it's so <laughs> yeah. cool that I want to talk about it. And perhaps, you know, our audience is... Um, the yeah. whole we have some really hardcore right. people that like listening and we have really casuals that listen and that's right. that's wonderful so for some people who may not know including me right can you tell me what the <laughs> zelda randomizer is okay so there there's a, leg, a legend zelda link to the past randomizer basically there are a myriad of options to basically make the game completely new every single run um you can randomize all of the items in all the chests and overworld spots uh, it also randomizes all of the um, crystals you need to do to beat the game. Um, there's also some other random ones like uh, entrance randomizer, which means you go out one door and it's not going to be where it normally is. Oh, wow. And that could also include going from light world to dark world. Woo. So that's fun. Uh, there's also key sanity, which basically uh, also, along with just randomizing all the items, also randomizes all the keys. Through all the dungeons. Amazing. Including the big keys. And then a new one that they just, uh, the team that just, I'm not part of the team, I just play it a lot. Sure. Um, a new one they just did is Enemy Randomizer. That could be amazing. Yes. That I could haven't be done great. that yet. Um, but like a lot of the, basically a lot of times what I do, I do um, either a normal randomizer, which basically means she does the escape as normal. Yes. Along with also getting the, uh, the white sword. Uh, um, from the Uncle Assured. <laughs> then there's another popular one that I do is open, which means it, the escape is already done and the first sword is also randomized. I see. So that can get uh, interesting. I mean, that is absolutely amazing. So um, this is, is this like a, a mod to a ROM? Is yeah. that how it's executed? Yeah, basically it's going off the original Japanese 1.0 ROM. Okay. That allows you to do some glitches like the um, item run glitch, um, a few of the other... Um, more famous glitches. I, I just basically, that's about the biggest one I do know. I see. Um, that, that's the ROM. Basically, uh, you upload to their website. You can just generate randomized games. They also have custom sprites for uh, Link. Ooh. There's a whole list. Um, they, they've done quite a bit. It's on version 30 now. Version 30. Yeah, it, it's really fun. Like, I, 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 yeah. I try to stream it weekly. You stream? Yeah. You stream it. What's your stream? Uh, fi- uh, Twitch.tv slash Firetron. Fire Drawn? Tron. Tron. T-R-O-N? Yes. F-I-R-E-T-R-O-N. So I try and do that about every Tuesday. Uh, I just had a really bad one where basically I was going into Turtle Rock. Yeah. So, um, but all I had was like, I had Red Mail, which was really nice, but I only had one bottle. I had the Master Sword and I only had normal magic and that just did not go well. I, <laughs> that's one of the few C, like... I try and complete all the ones. That one, I was like, I'm not feeling it tonight. But like, I, see. I do try and complete the seeds. I can do them in about two hours. And what's really cool is you actually have to kind of plan your route on what you get. So, right. that, but that's the coolest part of yeah, it, right? Right, because you're like, okay, let's see. Like, I have, I have the mirror, and I have, I have the mirror. I have like the flute, and I have the tinesmiths. Oh, technically, I can go into uh, the desert palace. Because you can go, you can go through the spot um, 
where you fly up right by the desert on the ledge, go to the Dark World by Swamp, or not Swamp, uh, Misery Mire, right, and then port back over to be on the top part of where it's behind the desert, and technically that's all in logic. Right. Uh, the right. one I do play is, it is all full logic. You don't have to do any glitches in order to actually do it, um, which is really nice, because I don't know many of the glitches. They do have, like, they do have logics where you have to know, like, the, some of the advanced glitches, like the wrong warps, the uh, early, like, going to the dark world when you're not supposed to. Right. I don't do those because I'm like, no. I see. <laughs> Yeah, I see. It's, it's one of the things that I'm identifying with is, you know, sometimes you'll hear about people doing like survive in the real world survival right. challenges, and right. they they only go with, I mean, the part of the <laughs> challenge is to go with very limited equipment or, right. or a borderline randomized right. equipment, or you don't have something. This yeah. is like the Legend of Zelda version of that. Yeah, and and they what's funny is they've also done it with uh, the original Legend of Zelda. Cool. They've also done with Ocarina of Time. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, I just no. I do Link to the Past. That's a very... You stick with A Link to the Past? Yeah, because that's just the one you chose? Or yeah, is like, like, A Link to the Past your favorite Zelda game? Or is it... Um, it like, I've... It's one of the easier games because, like, it's it's just two maps, but they're fairly... Like, it's fairly easy to remember where you need to go um, because they, they do a whole bunch of things, like, uh, on the maps tell you which... Um, which Dungeons are actually crystals. So this is amazing. I can't wait. I'm gonna. Yeah. We we have a we have a Twitch account for the show, but it's just sitting there right now. I can't. I, can't, I don't have time to stream, and I'm right. trying to host other people. Right. Oh, maybe we could host you sometime, or maybe we could just send people your way. Yeah, maybe. But I will subscribe. I cannot okay. wait to watch this. Yeah. No. It's uh. It's really fun. I try and do it Tuesday nights around six fifteen. Uh. CST. That's awesome. So yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for for chatting with us no for problem. a few minutes. All right, so I think we're just going to queue up Eric Hope's interview and keep rolling through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we switched seats, and you and he sat down, and here we go. Yep. So I'm back in the hot seat. This is uh, Alex at the Midwest Gaming Classic again for another Zelda podcast. And we have, are you Eric or Zach? Yes, I'm Eric. You're Eric, all right. <laughs> Dave uh, went through a similar problem. Um, so you approached the booth, and we started talking about randomizers. Randomizers. And then we got, we got one interview in the can. Sorry to use the jargon, but we got it in the can. Uh, so what are we going to talk about today? Let's, uh, let's keep talking about yeah, what we were talking about just now with Master Mode and Breath of the Wild. Yeah, there's a, a lot of things it does that makes it harder, not necessarily in good ways, but still a different enough experience to be worth going through, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. And I think you and I... Um, we're going about it in different ways. I I made the mistake of charging right to a Divine Beast, and uh, I started with Water Blight Ganon, and I'm not prepared. It's one hit kills every time. I've got four hearts. I've got one and a quarter stamina wheel, and it ended up being where it's not that I'm not having fun dying over and over again. I am. I truly am a masochist in that way, but it's <laughs> it's... It's, it's something I want to be past. So now I've had to back out of this Divine Beast, and I'm going to the Gerudo area to try and get the, the big shock yeah, thing the, that, I, that can Urbosa. help me. Yeah, Urbosa's Fury, yeah. right? Yep, I got that. So so how are you going about Master Mode? Um, Granted, I, I've set it down for a while, but I was doing just more of a general exploration kick, potentially with the thought of going to Ganon without getting any of the Divine Beasts oh. for the change of So you're just going to go straight to that weird pace. spider Ganon. Just to just to see if it's that any more difficult All right. without them helping, or if it's just basically oh, it takes three times longer. Personal right. curiosity more than anything, I suppose. So really, it's 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 the challenge is twofold. You have a stronger, angry Ganon, and then you also don't get the uh, any the, of the uh, any of the boons or whatever we're gonna call them, right? You don't get Mephis Grace if you get one one hit killed as yeah. I am frequently over and over which and over again. Which probably will happen, yeah. Right. Um, you do get that cool bow and arrow, though, which I wish you could have in the rest of the game once you beat <laughs> Ganon. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think back to the first of my first playthrough of it, and I definitely got all the Divine Beasts the first time around. Um, but I'm wondering if instead of knocking my head against the wall in Master Mode, if I shouldn't just like restart again and try and beat Ganon without any of the Divine Beasts. Is, that's a thing yeah. you've... Yeah. Well, Maybe with like it, a, a it's in progress, I guess. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Well, that's awesome. So we were talking as well uh, uh, about randomizers. Randomizers. And, and you said you were more of a Metroid or super, which uh, one? Kind of, I, I do some Link to the Past randomizer, although I played a whole bunch of it a couple mm -hmm. of years back and burned myself out on it a little sure. bit. 
started picking up the Super Metroid randomizer, and then I found out about this really cool randomizer that puts both games together Amazing. into one super game. So tell me about this. So um, how does that work, right? The, for the randomizer, you have to kind of get lucky with the upgrades and the order in which you get into the rooms and all that. Does it carry over game to game, or are you yeah. playing two games in parallel? So how, how the crossover works is you start in Super Metroid, and there are particular uh, door transitions that'll take you to the other game. So you'll enter a particular door, and you'll end up at some particular spot in Link to the Past. Yes. And so you're not playing both games simultaneously, but you are switching back and forth on the fly, and the items across both games are randomized across both worlds. Amazing. So Link can find the charge beam and Samus can find the bow. Oh, that is so good. And it adds a lot of really interesting um, routing options because between the the world teleporting, that can allow you to get into certain spots without the items you'd normally need in both games. Right, There's a way to sort of backdoor into stuff. You have to contend with the potential of knowing when to switch games to know where you have a higher amount of items to pick up. Oh, man, that that's really cool. It's so like, with Metroid, it's you can kind of um, get yourself out of some situations with the wall jump alone that even if you get ahead of yourself in the game, you can kind of have, have a little escape hatch with that. Is there anything like that in Zelda? Um, for the most part, no. There's a few different uh, techniques that you can use to sneak some stuff early. Uh, techniques like the fake flippers where you can mm-hmm. trick the game into thinking that you're swimming by jumping into the water and doing a screen scroll transition on the same <laughs> frame. Oh, well that just, it dawned on me now, can you save that fish in the first area where the, like after you lower the water uh, in that one oh. little dungeon area and the fish is flopping around on land, can you then, is it possible? Is it all one cell? Does it transition to another random I, room or can you save that fish? Fish, like at the at the dam. Yeah, I think you can sell the fish to the market guy for oh like gosh, 100 so rupees heartless. or something. That is so hard. <laughs> We're gonna get phone calls from PETA and a bunch of vegans. It's gonna be bad. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, Eric. He does randomizers. We won't call him canon, but I like to think of him as like just like a r- weird random acid trip from Link to the Past. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to plug while you're on the show? Um. I mean, I actually do run the combo, the the crossover combination randomizer oh, yeah. sometimes. So, yeah. so let's talk about that. Yeah. Where, where can people go to figure? Uh, I stream that on uh, Twitch TV okay. uh, at ei underscore streams. Ei underscore streams on Twitch TV, and I hope that you and Dak both join our Discord and talk more about Zelda. And I don't think we have anyone on there doing randomizers yet. We have well, one guy. We need runner. to start that. Let's uh, start, start that trend. Let's get let's get wild. <laughs> awesome. Thanks again, man. All right. Thank you. So that was a lot of fun to talk to Eric and Zach. I think so many years ago, I produced a podcast called Branching Dialogue. And I think we had it was in Milwaukee. I think we had Eric on as a guest oh, really? on that show um, talking about some Metroid speed runs, actually. Nice. It was a long time ago. I was only a producer on that show. I don't remember exactly. But I think that's because he looked familiar to me when uh-huh. we when we saw each other in the, uh, I guess, in the aisle. And I kind of felt like, oh, maybe there was this bar we used to go to and, you know, whatever. But I think I also, we had him on a guest on this. On this. Now, you know, that show's done now. But anyway, um, what, I, I want to play randomizers. This sounds oh, awesome. Absolutely. I definitely want to play randomizers. There's always, or there's also a uh, class of ROM hacks where they put uh, characters from video games, they keep all their physics and weapons, but they plop them into different games. Oh. So, for instance, there's, uh, there's a Mega Man 10 where you can play as Super Metroid Samus. And so you'll have her wall jumps and her... It's the Mega Man 10 levels, but with Samus in the Mega Man 10 levels? You got it. Whoa, cool. It's really cool. Uh, the last I played it, it was really glitchy and a long time ago, but <laughs> okay. I bet... Cool. Cool, cool, cool. I bet it's probably <laughs> pretty good now. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, also, shortly after this interview, another f- f- familiar face uh, walked past our booth. At this point in the day... It was very busy and full. There was a lot going on. We started, the, there were bands that started to play. And so we'll start getting some audio in the background yeah. here just a little bit. A downright ruckus. A downright ruckus. The microphones held up. They did They did pretty well and did not record too much in the background and recorded the voices uh, pretty well. So um, I'm super excited about this next little chat. It wouldn't even really be an interview, but this chat. Brian Tyson, Alex, was a gentleman that three or four years ago Towards the end of the Technophiles podcast, a show that you and I started like eight years ago. 
Brian came on and became the cameraman for when we were doing all those newscast uh, YouTube videos. Right. right, right, right. And he was amazing. He was a ton of help, and he was a blast. For a solid year there, he and I worked very closely together. And then I moved, and uh, you know, we stayed in touch online, but we hadn't seen each other in person for a couple years. And this is what a convention like this does. All of a sudden, Brian Tyson just kind of saunters past the booth looking at the Zelda stuff. He and did I was like, have a good saunter. I yeah. liked his saunter. It was good. Yeah, he's casual, like yeah. in a good way. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I had to sit down with Brian and catch up a little bit. All right. I am very excited about who I'm sitting here with right now. I am here with Brian. Now, Brian, you and I go back a little bit. A couple years ago, we worked together on um, on a, a podcast that I was had started, and we made some videos together, and I really enjoyed that time. Cool, thanks. And then I helped you, actually, very quickly at a Midwest Gaming Conference um, or Midwest like, Gaming Classic a couple years ago. Yeah, you're, you're kind of the B camera on a for... Yeah. It was a French band, uh, Mechanical Life Fane. They they play um, uh, video game jazz in real time while the game is being played and projected. So they are truly impressive and amazing, and we'll speak about that in just a second. Um, for the past couple of years, I've moved to Chicago, so we've lost touch a little bit, and here we are being able to bump into each other because of this event, and I'm so pleased. Cool. So I couldn't wait to, yeah. to get you in here on the booth and, and catch up a little bit. Yeah, great and, to an interview. You. Great to see you again. I don't think we've ever been on the mic together before. No, we haven't. Usually we're behind the camera together with someone else on the mic or something like that. So how, how you been? Um, okay, I've been uh, picking up more more video works, so odd editing jobs and that, uh, little work for a media company, that sort of thing. That's cool. Are you so, here for the Midwest Gaming Classic because of the with, you're here with the band, so yeah, to speak? Yeah, I, was, uh, I, I, I tend to film almost all their sets. I love it. I love it. So, they definitely performed well today. It was a pleasure to hear them. They did, uh, it was Metroid and DuckTales. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. With a little Mario Kart interlude, also. <laughs> In your opinion, how was the how was the performance? Did all the tech oh, go well and cameras worked out well? And- yeah, yeah, and uh, and it was cool for me. Cause I don't always see what they're gonna do next, and I didn't know they're gonna you like do. They did like the theme of Ducktales from the cartoon and everything as like the lead in. So that's, I love it. That's always a lot of fun. And what's the band's name again? The Mechanical Life Vein. Fantastic. Cool. So, they play here, I think, just about every year now these days, yeah. right? Yeah, I believe yeah, so. Wonderful. Cool. Well, we have to. It's a Zelda podcast. We have to talk a little bit about right. Zelda, even though it's it's a pleasure to see you again. Um, we are a little bit behind the curtain here with our audience. I think I might have you back on the show officially when we do our uh, Legend of Zelda or, or the Adventures of Link episode, essentially. Yes. But I don't think we're going to get to that game until season three because I do need my co-host to play the first uh, Legend of Zelda game. I think first, like to have some context, and we're, we'll be doing that in season three. So we may not officially see you on the show again for about another year. So let's talk a little, let's do a little preview now. Let's talk a little bit about The Adventures of Link. Um, Why does it stand out for you? Um, I know I'm a little strange for preferring that one, but uh, I think part of it was that game was so difficult from the beginning. Like that was a game I or none of my friends really would touch. But one day, uh, I think I was like 13, I just dug it out, started playing it, and I figured it out. And yeah. it actually, it's a game, what I defend about it is it becomes a lot more enjoyable once you get over the initial difficulty curve. Like, once you start leveling up and gaining more abilities, I think it's uh, fantastic. I, I really like the action RPG element, and, uh, you know, it keeps in with what Nintendo's second sequel game is a bit off, but... Uh, I agree completely. I actually kind of, these days, kind of love it myself. In fact, when I'm going back and playing some of the classics, I find myself going to the Adventures of Link more often than even The Legend of Zelda or like A Link to the Past or something like that. And I think it is because it is one of those games. You're absolutely right that it doesn't have a hard... It doesn't. It's not like the difficulty curves in the wrong direction, but it definitely does start you out with... It's interesting. How do you feel about this, what I'm about to say? Okay. Um, in any game, you want to acquire more items to empower your character to further the adventure. But sometimes, and this is the case with the Adventure of Link, the Adventures of Link, that also means you start with nothing. It actually, as the uh, the odd thing, what I like about that game, because uh, I I don't like traditional RPGs. So, like I I've tried many times. I and when I was a total n- junkie for the NES, like I tried Final Fantasy, Dragon Warrior, yep. could not get into them. I mean, I appreciate the the games for what they are. Z- Adventure of Link, on the other hand, I don't know if it's just the action element, but uh, I think I just like the balance of how they handle the, the RPG elements. Like, you, you have to, you know, level up your attack also in addition to your life and magic, so. Yeah, I agree. I will say it's kind of cool. It's the only Zelda game where as you're playing, you're watching 
the the numbers tick up to hit the next level of power or the next level of magic or something like yeah. that. And it's the only Zelda game that I genuinely go seek out. I guess you could say encounters or battles. You know, many of the other Zelda games, it's like, oh, okay, we got some creatures in the field. I'll I'll fight them yeah, or whatever. Here's the keys. Pick it out the boomerang. Yeah, you exactly. Know? Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, but with the adventures of Link, I am like, ooh, I want to get, I want to power up my sword. I'm going to go out there and, you know, essentially grind a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, well, I also think the combat element is really good. Uh, like, even when you're fighting the knights, I know that's probably uh, enough to send a lot of players into PTSD, but uh, <laughs> once you get down the mechanics of uh, how you block and when you have to stab at the right moment, uh, it really feels like you're dueling with the character, which is something, a mechanic, I you don't quite get in a lot of early Nintendo games and the like. So. I love that point. That is an excellent point. You're absolutely right. In the original Legend of Zelda, he kind of auto-blocks. If you're not swinging the yeah. sword, he'll block with the shield. With Adventures of Link, you have to push up and down, and you, you're strategically picking, is it better for me to attack high or attack low or block high or block low? And, yeah, I think for people who are used to hacking and slashing, that could be infuriating, but I love it. It sounds like you do, too. Yeah, and especially, and if it, the game becomes, like, 80% easier once you get the ability to stab down, and that's, uh, that's a very... It's once you once you get to that point, it, it, it's no longer overwhelmingly difficult, and that, to me, that's kind of where it kicks in. It, it does, yeah. You gotta commit for a while and really play mm. the game the way it wants to be played, and then you start to get rewarded, and it becomes pretty interesting. I want to ask you about how you feel about what is essentially the overworld in that game. It's a very different kind of overworld yeah. than any other Zelda game. Would you like to speak to that? I like it a lot, although admittedly, the random battles can are a little too frequent at times, as well as the times when you have to search the swamps because you can only you go you, that's slog yes you know and especially if you have to go one square at a time to find the hidden village or yes. or uh, what's his name you have to find some guy's cabin to open the bridge but there is not an icon representing his cabin exactly right exactly yeah yeah how do you feel about the it being one of the few Zelda games that has side scrolling elements I think they're handled very well actually uh, and. I, I do. I actually do all, like the design of the castles in, in this one, the, the um, with the elevators and left to right and right. finding the. I mean, there, maybe there's a bit of Metroidish in there. As uh, now that I think of it, is there any other Zelda game that you are also drawn to that is obviously very different than the Adventures of Link or anything about the Adventures of Link that you'd still like to speak to? Because we um, won't have a chance to talk about it for another year. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think also I, I, I kind of have to factor in. Uh, when I played the game, I, I, I don't know why it just something weird kind of clicked. I, I remember clearly I was uh, I was fourteen. I know I just started. I was a freshman in high school, so this would have been about nineteen ninety eight. I mean, I mean a, a clear decade after it was popular, but that's how I roll, I guess. But I don't know. I remember at the same time we were reading the Odyssey, um, and you know it was kind of the end end of fall, so, but you're still getting nice days. So I remember you know reading that, going for a bike ride, and then playing Zelda 2, and I, I don't know, it, that just kind of rounded things out. And uh, I, I'm into it. I'm yeah. okay with that. I like that collection and, of memories. Yeah, kind of. Well, I, I also, I have to say this sound a bit odd, but uh, maybe in regards to the overworld, uh, I grew up across the street from the cemetery, which interesting. Um, the landscape I, is, it, it's smaller to me now, obviously, but like it had ponds, pine trees, uh it had this big like rock pile, uh, the big woods in the back, and then I, re I remember going exploring through those woods, and behind that was like this big, like drainage basin, like between the neighborhoods. That's it's, it's like a big circle, like a quarter of a mile in diameter, and I, I don't know, just the landscape is kind of not unlike uh, some of the early Zelda games, including the first one. I and, agree uh, completely. That must have been quite the adventure as a kid to live in an environment like that. And actually, what I what I like about that all that uh, I, memory is because uh, Mr. Miyamoto said that his inspiration for Zelda was exploring stuff around Kyoto as a kid and finding a cave. And it's kind of like, oh yeah, that's I can totally see that because I felt like I was doing something similar. So. I love it, Brian. I'm smiling ear to ear right now as you say this because we are totally on the same page. I absolutely was going to be like, oh, I'll, I'll totally say how it's similar to Miyamoto's <laughs> experience, and you are right on it. Um, so that is exciting. Well, I can't wait for us to get together officially again, probably about a year from now, <laughs> but um, to really dive into <laughs> Zelda 2. I think that'll be really, really exciting. And, and also I should replay it in preparation, so yeah, I got yeah, a little bit of time. We'll, we'll also, well, we'll, I'll... 
I've never beaten Zelda 2. I'm, I've oh, no. always gotten about a half, about halfway because I didn't really dive into Zelda 2 until I'll confess until really that NES that NES Classic came out a couple oh, years yeah. ago. It was basically I played through the Legend of Zelda a couple times and I was like, you know, I'd never liked Zelda 2 as a kid, but I'll try it. And then as an adult, the very things that we're talking about tonight, I started finding myself really liking about it. And so it took me even longer than than you. It took me all the way up into my mid adulthood to really appreciate the game but um, I do these days I really it's do a, and I also like that there's certain th- there's stories about how um, the combat system in Ocarina actually references the combat mm. system in Zelda 2 I think it's pretty cool yeah and uh, Ocarina also uh, uh, references the names of the towns all that like Saria is a town you're right and uh, so I, I thought that was a really cool little uh, I love it well for so, now thank you so much for, uh, for, 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 for sir, jumping into our booth and chatting yeah certainly thanks for having me on good to talk to you so that was um, um, absolutely a pleasure to bump into Brian again, and I think we might. I'm going to follow up on that. I'm, I think I'm going to get him in on season three for our Zelda, our Adventure of Link uh, episode. I think that'd be a great idea. You guys dove pretty deep on that, and it makes a ton of sense that... Uh, so one of the reasons I don't like Zelda 2 as much is mm-hmm. because there is... Um, it's too easy to permanently die and have to reset. Well, the there beginning. is that. And I haven't given it enough time to get to the point where I'm powerful enough to not have to worry about that. Yes, I agree. There is that for sure. Yeah. There is that reset after what is it? Three lives or something? Yeah, yeah. You get and three. So you get if, yeah. If you run out of hearts, you get, it's a it's a life out or a game over or whatever. Not a game over, but you lose a life. And I don't think you gain too many lives. Yeah, I think uh, I don't think you gain lives. I think every time you level up, you can choose to more hearts. Get more hearts, but. Yeah, the lives, I, I don't think you can get more of. Yeah, right. That's one of the few Zelda games where it puts you right back at the beginning. Yeah. But then it also resets a lot of the game world stuff, too, I believe. Takes the wind we'll right see. out of your sails, Dave. <laughs> we'll see. So um, so uh, then, you know, the, the day kept going. I can't wait to talk to Brian again in about a year. Um, and then some, I think I was starting to, like I said, it was starting to get really busy. Maybe I was chatting with Brian. So I turn around, I turn around and you are chatting with a gentleman that, um, I don't know, you guys must, I think you guys were talking a little bit out in the aisle when I was talking with Brian. You sat down. What, tell me what, what, what Cyber Gameway is. Yeah, Cyber Gameway, this was, we didn't talk much about Zelda, I don't think, but Cyber Gameway is sort of a, an all-in-one streaming platform to try and monetize your streams. Oh. And rather than try and explain it, I think they do a good job of, uh, Telling you what it let's is. Pretty, let's pull it up. All right, Alex again at the Midwest Gaming Classic. We are here to talk about a pretty cool service called Cyber Gameway. Hi, Alex. Thank you for having me. My name is Ryan, and I represent Cyber Gameway. All right. So, what is this thing? Tell me all about it. So, Cyber Gameway at its core uh, is a platform for gamers, streamers looking for more exposure. Uh, specifically, we help our streamers uh, through our social media, our website, and of course, the ever so growing popular Discord server. So we help promote them through our website by giving them their own profile page. Uh, we help our streamers out by allowing them to essentially brand their own merchandise. Uh, we put their brand on our store uh, for our you know, t-shirts, hoodies, uh, as well as other apparel. So that, that's just one facet of what we do. Yeah, that's really cool. So so I'm like, let's say I'm a, a speedrunner for, let's say, Link to the Past or something, right? Okay. How do I get on board with you guys? What do I do? So first thing you want to do is you want to reach out to us. You can hit us up on our Discord server by going through our website. Uh, you can We have a tab at the top. You can just click on that site, and it'll take you right to our Discord. What's you, that website? The website is cybergameway.com. Terrific. Thank you. Thank right. you. Keep talking. What are the goals and aspirations? <laughs> So some of the goals for Cyber Gameway is we are currently in our beta streamer program right now. Um, And furthermore, we are looking to grow our uh, stream team uh, significantly. So what, what that means for you is we bring you on board. We help you gain exposure, like I mentioned beforehand, and we also give you the tools to help you become successful in streaming. Sure, sure. So uh, some of those, for example, you know, uh, getting, first of all, having your own e-commerce site, as some people know, is is very, it's expensive. You know, you're looking at a significant um, investment every year. Mm -hmm. And through Cyber Gameway, you're foregoing all of those costs and you're jumping straight to earning some income immediately at zero cost to you. So that's kind of what... uh, uh, really is Cyber Gameway right now and and the goals and aspirations is to build our, our stream team up. Beautiful. Well, we're here at uh, Midwest Gaming Classic with Cyber Gameway. And what we were talking about a little bit, which I want to get to because you know, this is a, uh, a very targeted 
podcast about a very specific game, but what we were talking about in general was like the the social nature of gaming and and how as an entertainment mode, there's so much you can do, whether it be speedrunning or streaming or whatever, or even just like playing with your friends. It's not like watching a movie where you sit in silence next to each other and like zone out. What about gaming uh, appeals to you? Man, for gaming, I grew up so... I grew up, my father owned an IT company my entire life. I grew up with a keyboard and mouse in my hand. Nice. You know, at the young age of two, uh, two, three, playing the original StarCraft. Yeah, uh, Playing the Warcraft, Warcraft 2, Duke, Doom, Quake, all the originals. Nice. Um, so I've just always grown and found that uh, the social side of gaming is is everything. You know, growing up, we especially I'm 26 now, so growing up, going through school, we were always taught, you know, hey, that wasn't really out there. It wasn't in the forefront. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you what, some of the, the relationships uh, that I've built and the, the really friends that are now family that I've made is a beautiful thing with gaming. Well, absolutely. And we have a we have a Discord server for this show itself. And, like, it's a pretty vibrant community. It kind of speaks to um, the social nature of video games. And I think that, like, gamers kind of get a bad rap for being a little, like, antisocial and inward. Oh, but, but really, like, I, I think that they're... Uh, they're very outgoing as long as you find some common ground and like that that's evident in the discord server that's evident with all my friends who stream and speed run and all that um i just there's there's no other form of entertainment that's kind of like this the camaraderie when you find that that group of people like-minded individuals who uh you know join get up get involved in your community it just it, it helps it soar it is a beautiful thing yeah so this is the point i want to make here too it's like for all those people with gamer tags that were playing halo in 10 years ago <laughs> yeah. and all your friends finally left you when master chief collection comes out uh, make the same gamer tag on steam so we can all find each other again absolutely i know we here at cyber gameway are looking extremely forward to the halo coming out on pc oh me too <laughs> oh my god the big team battles cyber gameway will be out there awesome so to all of our fans, sorry we didn't talk about Zelda, but that, you know, it's, uh, we're talking about games. And uh, <laughs> check out Cyber Gameway, cybergameway.com. We're here at the Midwest Gaming Classic, and I, I don't know who you'll hear from next. That's the fun of this. It's like a randomizer, which we talked about. You may have heard about the randomizer by now, but you might not have. Who knows how we're going to edit this episode? Anyway, thank you for being with me, and enjoy the rest of the convention. Hey, thank you for having me, Alex. All right. Bye-bye. Oh, I'm so glad we already did the randomizer part. <laughs> well, part of this was there's a lot of callbacks from one interview to another. This That's part of what made me decide that maybe we should just do this chronologically today. Oh. Um, I really thought at first, I was like, okay, well, I'll re-edit all the interviews and maybe all the people that talked about Zelda, all the people talked about this. Narrative. About, yeah, a little bit. And then I thought, let's just do this as a, let's go, let's tell the story that we experienced. Because then it allows these interviews to reference each other and all of that. So... The next part of that experience was a fellow 6'5 media er get out swung by. <laughs> that was really authentic, Alex. You threw me. You threw me. I'm keeping this on the air. I thought we um, were ready to go into the next. I, I thought it was a perfect transition, but you know, oh, if you want to keep talking, in. that's cool. It's cool. Should have gone in. Yeah, Max, Max Olmsted and Jordan Johnson, both, uh, both the creators of the Top Hat Balloon Show, another 6'5 media show, came by. Now, um, some of our listeners already heard the first half of my interview with Max Olmsted on my episode with John, where Max talked about our booth and talked about what a, a Top Hat Balloon Show booth might be like, and we talked a little bit more about 6.5. Then the second half of that interview, we did jump into Zelda. So on my episode with John last week, I basically cut it right as we were about to say, like, all right, let's talk about Zelda. So let's pick that up here. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Uh, so you were mentioning, actually, as we were setting up the microphones here, that your first Zelda was actually, I think, Ocarina. It was, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was... Uh my family actually didn't have a game system when I was a kid, yeah. and so I would go to people's houses and basically just to play their video games. I'd be <laughs> yeah. like, I would find the children oh. that had the video game systems. Uh-huh. I'd be like, Hey, you want to like, you want to hang out or something? Maybe buy your TV. You know, we could we could play Ocarina. I don't know in the uh, general maybe. area of your television. Oh, what is this? A Nintendo sixty four? Oh, weird. Oh. Not plugged in. That's I can just plug it in. I could do that. It'd be fine. <laughs> but yes. So, so yeah, that's how I found Ocarina to start, was just seeking out these children with, with, the, with the video game systems. You had a spreadsheet and, and everything. going for but it. But you know what? Yeah. That's actually really funny because that Ocarina of Time is a game that you, can't, you cannot necessarily play in quick bursts or short spurts, yeah. you could no. say. It's a, it's a longer game, especially for the time. Mm-hmm. How did you manage that? If you have to keep, well, did you have to really befriend a lot of people, you manipulative jerk. Well, the- <laughs> 
Yeah, that's me. <laughs> so these these friends that I would find. <laughs> <laughs> yes, keep Strictly, going. Strictly for their video game knowledge, mm-hmm. they would be Super Zelda fans. And so they could kind of guide me through got it. this period of time where there wasn't the internet. Yeah. So if I got stuck in a game, I would just be stuck. And there would there would be no... I would have to go buy one of those manuals that I wouldn't buy. And uh, I'd, I'd eventually just stop playing a game because of that. But because I had these friends that knew about Zelda, they could kind of guide me through this game. Mm-hmm. And we would have this sort of... Padawan master experience. I like it. So post Ocarina, <laughs> when's when's the first time you played a Zelda game on a system that you actually owned? Post Ocarina, the first one that I played was Breath of the Wild. Oh my god! It was god. all the way yeah. until the Switch came out, and that was the that was as you know the launch title of that system. It was like the mm-hmm. only thing you could play basically, but I just love that one. So fun. Just the open worldness of it. Breath of the Wild is amazing. It's a. It it's, is. I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan. Yeah. I used to say that my two favorite games were Twilight Princess and Link's Awakening. Link's Awakening being the, the first Game Boy one. Mm-hmm. My heart still goes out to Link's Awakening. I'm very excited about this Link's Awakening thing that's coming out on Switch. Me too. But um, that looks fantastic. Twilight Princess got knocked off its pedestal once Breath of the Wild came out because wow. I, I think Breath of the Wild is actually what I was pretending Twilight Princess was. I was pretending Twilight really Princess. Really wanting it to be that, yeah, but yeah. it just wasn't. Wanting quite it to there. be open world, but it really wasn't. Wanting, it, you know what I mean? And wasn't there some weird control kind of stuff in Twilight Princess because it was on Wii, right? So you're right, and I disagree. <laughs> okay. No, but what I mean is, you're absolutely right. There was some weird controls. Yeah. But Twilight Princess, not too dissimilar from Breath of the Wild, was actually made for the system that came out before the system it actually released on. So I have said on this show, I consider Twilight Princess to be a GameCube game, not a Wii game. Gotcha. It's a GameCube game that got ported to Wii. Just like Breath of the Wild technically is a Wii U game that got ported to the Switch. It truly is. Interesting. Interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, this Breath of the Wild sequel will be the first true Switch Zelda game. Wow. Well, I'm looking forward to that one. I mean, that line is so thin that it's a technicality to say this, that Breath right. of the Wild is a Wii U game, but it is. But but when you play, let me say this to wrap this up then. Twilight Princess played on GameCube makes wonderful sense. It plays a lot like Wind Waker. Right. The buttons are correct and it feels like the right way to play the game. When you yeah. play it on the Wii, it feels like those controls are tacked on. Mm-hmm. So I own the GameCube version of Twilight Princess. I don't even bother with the Wii version. It's... <laughs> It's gone. Yeah, because the the Wii just never felt like a gamer's system, and Zelda is very much a gamer's game. Yeah. Like, you need need that controller kind of feel. Indeed. And the Wii just didn't have that. We have, like, celebration happening over here on our systems right now. (laughs) I love it. I think 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 one of our passerbys just did the now infamous A Link to the Past glitch, where you go into the castle and you glitch forward all the way up to Ganon and stuff like that. Wow. I think that's what I was hearing happening. Well, Max, we're going to talk more. Yes. We're going to have you on shows more. If, uh, if people are interested in checking out your show, The Top Hat Balloon Show, say, where could they find it? Yes, they, they could find us on the thetophatballoonshow.com, as well as on YouTube if you look up Top Hat Balloon Show, mm-hmm. and on iTunes as well. Max, thank you so much. I, uh, thanks for jumping into the booth here. <laughs> Wonderful being here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I never see you. No. Mm-mm. But nope. we talk it's all the time. Like, yeah, right? Cool, dude. <laughs> yeah, Enjoy great. the rest of the, uh, the event. Thank you. <laughs> so then um, Jordan stepped up and we got him on the on the chair and right around this time what do I know Jordan from? Jordan Johnson from the Top Hat Balloon Show oh my gosh where can I find that? you can find that over at thetophatballoonshow.com it's part of the 6-5 media family <laughs> <laughs> getting, this episode's getting a little long here Alex but you know what it's a podcast this is just I just knew like let's just let this one be a big episode you know Dave you gotta expand before you contract. I'm I'm for that. I'm, and I'm, since you have to edit this, <laughs> I don't care how long we talk. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Let's pull up this interview with Jordan. Um, the, we we were chatting. A band started playing in the background, and uh, it got so loud that we we decided to, to to cut the interview. And then, unfortunately, both Jordan and I were like, okay, well, we'll swing back on Sunday and we'll talk. And then when he did swing back, I actually wasn't at the booth at no, that time. I was. I, and you were. And I didn't want to talk to them. <laughs> uh, I needed them to leave as soon as possible. <laughs> and so we didn't get to finish our interview, but we did get chat with Jordan a little bit. I think what we'll do is we'll listen to Jordan here, and then we'll go to an actual break in this episode. Sound good? Ooh, yes. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, I am here with Jordan Johnson. I'm very excited to uh, to be with you here, Jordan. I, I did just get done talking with Max, too, but um, you and Max are part of the Top Hat Balloon Show. How are yep. you, first of all? I'm doing very well. How are I should you, get David? Your voice. I should get your voice on the podcast. Yeah. I apologize. No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Dave, he says. <laughs> David, I said. <laughs> I didn't say Dave. No, no, it's all good. Okay. Um, so you and Max are here kind of as civilians today. You're here yes. just hanging out and enjoying the... Yeah, we've been coming here for years now. It's a lot bigger than it used to be. It's getting huge. In fact, as we speak, I can tell that they're doing sound tests for the band that's about to <laughs> Which play. Which is crazy. I'm sure it's showing up on the mics right now, but that's fine. It's all part of the energy that's yeah, here at the exactly. event. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, like, we just passed by a guy who was doing, like... I don't know if he was just filming a video of himself uh, interacting with here or if he was, like, live streaming it. Okay. But, yeah, this used to happen in, like, the basement of a hotel, and now... It was, now, like, in the basement of a hotel, and then it was in a tent in the parking lot of a hotel, and now it's at, now this, it's a whole it's at one of the biggest convention centers in Milwaukee. Which is crazy. It's really cool, though, to see it. Yeah. So you've even... Changed like that. I came to... A, I went to a Midwest Gaming Classic a couple years ago. Yeah. Back when it was in the tent. Yeah. An enormous tent, but a tent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then a couple of years, I wasn't able to. Now that I live in Chicago, I don't come up here this way. So right. this is our first time, first time ever having a booth here. Right. I, this I is was, a really nice booth. I'm so pleased with it. This is a 6.5 booth. It's really cool. There's a lot of effort that went into this. And uh, Max and I were joking about this a little bit too, but like, there will be a day where some of this stuff's used for a top hat balloon reason. Which would be awesome. Yeah. We don't know what it is just yet, but we know that we have it at our disposal. So are you looking for anything in particular at the event, or are you kind of here for the experience? Um, well, always here for the experience. Always looking to play some pinball. Um, I'm, uh, I'm also looking for some games because, you know, uh, Max and I recently uh, bought a bunch of old systems for nostalgia's sake. Amazing. You know, we bought, like, okay, I mean... This doesn't sound like it should be an old thing, but original Xboxes are old now. Oh, yes, yeah. definitely. I have one. <laughs> yeah, and we like grew up with that. And so we bought that Nintendo 64. Yep. Um, Maybe a PS2 I, or something. Yeah, I bought a, a Super Nintendo recently. Wonderful. And I bought, I uh, actually got a Zelda game for that too. I haven't uh, played that one yet. A I Link got, to the Past or something else? Uh, it, it must have to be a Link to the Past, yes, actually. Yes. Um, Everything else for the Super Nintendo is like a ROM. Heck. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, uh, but I've been. I was. Uh, I got distracted playing like the old uh, Donkey Kong Country and um, the Super Mario World because those are the, those are the really nostalgic ones. Nostalgic ones for me. I, I agree. Playing up. Yeah, uh, that really up qualifies as a distraction. That's just appropriate <laughs> yeah. to play those games. <laughs> you know, they're so fun. Yeah, yeah, they're good. Ta- good times for sure. That's one of those things. Like, I was really little when I played Super Nintendo, like at my grandpa's house. Sure. So now when I like turn it on, it's like immediately like. Those the music notes like trigger memories, you know, like yep. my brain is like, oh my gosh, my whole childhood is just flashing before my eyes. <laughs> so your favorite Zelda game is probably not a link to the past, and I would agree with you on that. But do you have a favorite? Um, Ocarina. The guy before he was Ocarina. I, I mean, Ocarina of Time is a good one. Um, I actually did play a link to the past quite a bit at yeah. some point. It wasn't on Super Nintendo though. Maybe it was a it, virtual console thing or something on yeah. Wii or something. There was one I used to play on my Game Boy a lot. So li- the uh, Link's Awakening. I used to play Link's Awakening that's a lot. One of my favorite. But there was games. a couple different ones I played after Link's Awakening. Then there was the two Oracle games, Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages, and they were right. for the Game Boy Color. And then there was Minish Cap for the Game Boy Advance. Do any of those I sound think familiar? Oracle of Ages. Yeah, Ages is a good one. That's the time travel one. Yes, that's cool. Very cool. That's what, is that the one where there's like a tower? Yep. Yes. The tower in the middle. Yes. Yeah. And also that came out after Ocarina. So there were Zoras and Gorons. Right, and right, like right. the proper, not the proper kind, but the post Ocarina right. Zoras. So here's an interesting story. So um, my older brother, yeah. he's, uh, he's like 10 years older than me. So when I was really little, uh, he had a, an original su- or a, an original Nintendo. And yep. He loved Zelda, and so did I, but I was, you know, too young to understand how to play, and I was really bad at it. And so, back then, you know, there wasn't as much... You couldn't go online and just be like, how do I beat this game? Yes. So he bought a stack of note cards, and on each note card, he drew the screen. Oh, my God. And he put them all together. So I remember going into his room, and he had, like, 100 by 100 of these note cards all laid out with the entire map drawn, each screen on each note card. And then on each card, he would write, like, these are the secrets I've found on this card. Or, like, this is how you get through this part. That sounds amazing. It was amazing. And, like, 
I didn't understand. I didn't know how to do any of that as a kid. But you know, I always loved just watching my older brother be able to <laughs> play and beat the games. That must have been like a magical. You must have felt like Indiana Jones looking at those those <laughs> yeah, note cards, no, like there, this, it was, this, it was this really archive. Cool. Yeah, and like I was there as he was like going through and figuring out the things and writing them all down. It was it was really cool. Yeah, that's amazing. So um, yeah, I mean honestly, that let's let's actually talk about that a little bit. Um, it is interesting how the internet's a wonderful, beautiful thing. Uh huh. But as we've even done review episodes for this show and other Zelda podcasts, yeah. Occasionally, my my co-host Kate. Who who absolutely adores playing Zelda games, but she'll even confess that sometimes she'll hit a walkthrough at a certain yeah, point. Yeah, and I've done it too in in my time. Right, I try to not reference the internet as much as possible to right. keep the play right, right, right. kind of pure yeah, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, but boy, it's that really, really has changed how you play a game a little bit. Because I used to just be like, I got to a part where I don't know how to do this. I guess I'll wait and come back later when I've cleared my head like yeah, it's you right. can only try again there right. isn't like a at most you yeah. talk to someone about it on the schoolyard right, right. the and next they're week like, you know i know how to do this yeah you know that's that was like how it was for me i had an older brother who was like more informed than i was and he could tell me how to beat it but yeah it used like i remember even playing ocarina of time as a kid um and like like the internet was, you know, there, but I, I wasn't yeah. able to like use it as Ocarina easily. Ocarina of Time was like the dial-up days, kind of. Yeah, yeah. You know, you'd <laughs> load a page. Was, it was a lot of effort if you wanted to go on the internet. <laughs> and so, yeah, I remember like that game took me like literal years to to beat because I would play it a bunch, and then I'd like get stuck, and then I'd like forget about it for a long time, and then come back to it and like have to remember where I was stuck, and then like. I would like figure out little by little. It sounds like they're playing Sonic in the background. Oh, that's here. definitely Sonic. Yeah, I think, I think the band is up and going. We, okay. we might push through. We'll see. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. We'll see. I mean, I'm going to see you again more this weekend. Yeah, if, definitely. if we lose something here, maybe we can record sure. something again. But, um, um, yeah, and actually to that point, um, Miyamoto mentioned that in the original The Legend of Zelda, they put many, I mean, every screen at least has one secret in it. So, yeah. you know, one little thing to bomb or whatever. Right, right. right. And that when you look at that on a map on the internet today, it seems like almost too many secrets. Right. But you, but, have, to, but you have to remember that at that time, maybe people would find five of them. Right, yeah. Like, if you found one, you'd be like, oh, that's really cool. Like, And you had to come across them by chance. Right. Yeah. So uh, having a over, like, way too many is a great amount when nobody knows where they are. <laughs> right. I mean, it could take, conceivably, it could take weeks and months of you chatting with your friends or coworkers right. about, oh, well, there's this thing here to get a couple and, extra rupees. And that's why he wanted to do the note card thing. Your, your brother. He could have, yeah, because he could have a whole, you know, like his whole dial or a catalog of all the secrets that he's found. Yeah. And he was, was making an overworld map. Right. Exactly. I love it. I <laughs> it love so it. so good. Cool. So Max was mentioning that uh, um, you guys are playing Breath of the Wild a little bit. Yes. Um, I haven't in a while. Yeah, but I'm gonna yes. get this a little closer to you. Sorry. No, you're fine. Um, but yeah, Max was Max was playing it a lot more than I was. I see. Yeah, I see. It's so su- it's super fun though. It's so cool. I think we might have to wait. I think we won't be catching much after this. Okay. But anyway, we'll we, maybe we can grab another cycle later tonight or something. Okay. I wanted to ask you. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Top Hat Balloon Show stuff okay. too. Okay. Sure. Sounds good. So there it was, Alex. We we cut it there, and um, I say that we go to break here. But do you have any comments about what Jordan was talking about? Jordan was the second one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I I was lucky enough to have an older cousin who would do all the legwork for me with regard to like drawings and and maps and all that stuff. So I, I didn't see. have to do any of that garbage. I just went over to your house. Oh, me? Yeah, you. Oh, I didn't realize you were talking about me. I mean, yeah, I yeah. did do that stuff, but I right. didn't realize. Right, right. So uh, I, I, I'd, I'd inherit the uh, the institutional knowledge with regard uh, to Zelda. Ah, yes. And, uh, I just had fun. That's cool. That's cool. So this is what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to go to break. We'll probably hear a Top Hat Balloon Show ad right now. Mm-hmm. And we're going to come back and we have a, a, a couple more interviews to get through. And I think we'll just try to hit, to hit them very quickly, okay? Yeah. Right. Some some back to back, minimal. Yeah, well, we have some. Yeah, we have some guests from other podcasts that we spoke to in the second half that I'm excited uh, to share. Right. And uh, uh, we also talked. I was able to speak to Aiden and Todd Friedman again. They actually were. They appeared on our video game summit episode. So we have some good stuff coming up. But let's go to break now, and and keep on going. 
There's that notification. <laughs> we have to keep all three now. Yeah, I'll see you on the other side of the break. Bye. Hey, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. I just wanted to take a half a minute here to tell you a little bit about another Zelda podcast's Patreon page. We set up our Patreon account about halfway through Season 1, and the support that we've received over there has been humbling, to be honest. Uh, I'll just get right down to the details. We are basically offering three different tiers for um, anyone who wants to support another Zelda podcast. We have the sword tier, the white sword tier, and the magical sword tier. We are very proud of ourselves for coming up with those three tiers. Um, Essentially, the sword tier allows people to just say thank you to another Zelda podcast, get a little bit of recognition on the website. White sword uh, offers some uh, additional content, bonus content, extra, extra episodes, little little half episodes that we put out and um, also all episodes come out a week early with a little bit of commentary on the top and no ads so you will not be hearing this <laughs> on a patreon file we also finally have our magical sword tier which has all the other things added into it and also access to an elite discord channel that we run which allows us to have a very personal connection with the uh, people of patreon to be honest i have a lot of fun recording the little intros that i add onto the episode and also putting together some of these. We'll, we, you know, if we interview someone, sometimes we'll put the uncut interview on our Patreon page. I joke sometimes, it's almost like what special features were on DVDs way back in the day. That's what we offer on our Patreon account for the White Sword level and the Magical Sword level. All right, like I said, I don't want to waste too much of your time here. Go check it out at patreon.com, another Zelda podcast. You can also find links and uh, a list of our current supporters over on anotherzeldapodcast.com. Hey, my name is Max. And I'm Jordan. And we're here to talk to you about a little show called the Top Hat Balloon Show. Yeah, the Top Hat Balloon Show comes out every week. It's a sketch comedy show. You can see sketch comedy. And other kinds of things. You can subscribe to us on YouTube or iTunes, or visit our website at tophatballoonshow.com. You're sure to have a hilarious time. Click the link in the description. Hey everybody, David Geisler here again to talk to you about a new show from 6.5 Media. It's called The Studio Demands It. Now, two gentlemen, T.C. DeWitt and Jim Brzezelic out in California, they're both screenwriters and filmmakers. They uh, host a podcast wherein they try to fulfill the demands of a fictional studio. Each episode, they draw a fictional demand out of a fictional hat, and they try to meet the demands of the studio. They've already done episodes about how to do a true Die Hard 6, how to reboot the Cannonball Run franchise. They did a Lone Ranger episode, and most recently, they did an episode on how to create a Home Alone 3 and 4, a legitimate Home Alone 3 and 4, not the uh, direct video spinoffs that happened. And that episode was actually uh, submitted by a listener. In fact, we now have a button on the website studiodemandsit.com that allows anyone to create a fictional studio and a fictional demand. We already have a few of them in the queue. It's pretty exciting because it really does keep TC and Jim on their toes when the when a topic just comes out of the blue. So if you go to studiodemandsit.com, there is a submit a studio demand button right in the upper right of the website. Demand anything you want, any kind of crazy sequel idea or some kind of thing that uh, a fictional film studio would need. And let's see what we can make these two gentlemen have to come up with. I don't care if it's animated dancing monkey romances or uh, maybe it's just the sequel to, oh, what could it be? Maybe the sequel to Alfonso Cuaron's film Gravity. That'd be pretty interesting. Okay, everybody, uh, back to the show. Check them out. All right, we are back from the break. And a relaxing break it was. Oh, it was so relaxing. I blew my nose. <laughs> I've got a cold, so that wow. felt great. Wow. This is this is good information. You'd be surprised how much comes out when you have a cold. Ay, yeah, yeah. We've gone too far. It's green like Link. Uh, y- yes, okay, very good. Wonderful, wonderful. I was happy to know that about your biological systems. Uh, let's talk about the Midwest Gaming Classic. So so yeah the day the day, the day kept going and it was it was really nice and then actually I had a kind of surprise um guest I guess you could say a new family member oh. of mine Oh yeah that's right Michael Rogers I met them cuz I am not related to them you're, so I had never met them You're related to me through the other branch of the family right. through my mom's side Yes. Well these are my cousins through my dad's side uh Carly and Michael married each other just recently I was oh. at the wedding it was it was beautiful. It was a Just very a beautiful, beautiful wedding. It was really nice. Yeah, Mazel tov. It was heartwarming. Uh, no, uh, no, not that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but 
<laughs> um, Michael and I sat down. It was the first time we were really able to were kind of to have an actual conversation. We chatted a little bit at other weddings, at my sister's wedding, stuff like that. But it was nice to kind of get down and talk about actual Zelda stuff. So yeah. let's bring it up. All right, I am here with our next guest. Why don't you tell people who you are and why you're here? Uh, I'm Michael Rogers, and why I'm here is because I love Midwest Gaming Classic. This is my sixth year here, Whoa. and it's a phenomenal uh, place to be. Absolutely love the heck out of it. Michael, that's very exciting. There's another nice little detail that I uh, chose to hold off on for a few seconds here, but we are now family. It is true. We are family. Isn't that right? Absolutely. I was, I was able to attend uh, my cousin's and yours wedding just about a half a year ago. Absolutely. It was beautiful. It was touching. I cried a little. It was a wonderful, wonderful wedding. Absolutely. I uh, enjoyed it myself. After all, I was in it. <laughs> no, what's really, after all, I was in it. I love it. <laughs> what's even cooler about meeting up today is we didn't actually... We, we didn't plan to like actually see each other today. No, it was a total surprise, which is really awesome. I love it. It was a surprise for me as well. I saw something, uh, Carly, my cousin, had texted something or tweeted something or Facebooked something, and I was like, oh, maybe I'll see them. And almost right off the bat, I bumped into you guys. It was it was a pleasure. Yeah. So let's actually talk about the Midwest Gaming Classic a little bit. Absolutely. Um, you've been coming here far longer than I have. I'm a big fan, but I'm kind mm-hmm. of a, a newbie to it. Right. This is absolutely the first time we've ever had a booth here. And I attended twice before. But you're like a veteran here. What What is it about the Midwest Gaming Classic that you enjoy, uh, that makes you enjoy attending it the most? Uh, where to start? Um, part of it's the vendor hall. The vendor hall happens to have all kinds of really neat things. Yeah. Sometimes you're running independent developers, podcasts. Um, you get artists that come in and do some really awesome stuff. Um, there's some artists that we come and visit every year actually to see. And uh, just plenty of stuff to pick up. The arcade room with the pinball and arcade games is just top notch. Uh, if you're looking for anything super cool to play, that's always there. I mean, it's just, yeah, awesome visitors as far as it goes. Uh, sometimes you run into like John St. John, the voice of Duke Nukem. Um, Ernie yep. Hudson's here this year. So, I mean, there's just a lot of really cool reasons to be here. It's one of those things where. I come here, and as soon as the day is done, I go, man, is it next year already? It's just, it really draws me in that much, and I have nothing but a good time when I'm here. I love it. I love it. Fantastic. We are so excited to be a part of the community ourselves. Yeah. Um, it was a little nerve-wracking. I was a little, I was kind of scared setting up yesterday. I, I just, I felt so intimidated because there's so many cool things that happen here. Right. But uh, we are here at, uh, for another Zelda podcast, the podcast that we are celebrating today in the vendor hall, which I'm very pleased that we are in. Um, so let's talk some Zelda. Absolutely. And there's lots of Zelda to talk about. Oh, really? What would you like to talk about? I was going to ask uh, your favorite game, but is there something oh, different you'd like to talk about? Uh, yeah, if you want to talk about favorite let's games. Uh, mine's more of uh, a, a trinity or a triforce, if you will, of okay. favorite games. I always like uh, Link's Awakening. Uh, we can even say Link's Awakening DX. Uh, I the like game where Boy. this is going. Yep. Oracle of Ages and Oracle Seasons. All of them are Capcom Nintendo games, and they all just play phenomenally. I mean, they've got good platforming elements and even some side-scrolling platforming in there to go with your top-down aspects. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan of the Game Boy games, big time. Even even as we've been recording this show over the last year and a half, I've, I've we've reviewed a few of them. And it's just reminded me how much I loved them when I played them when they first came out on, oh, yeah. like, the Game Boy Color. You know, now I'll put it on, like, a TV through a Retron or a Game Boy Player or something like that. Yeah, Game Boy Advance Player is a great way to do it. There's something about Game Boy Advance. Yeah, right. There's something about holding it down in your hands that still really gives it some magic. So mm-hmm. out of those three, then I must ask, is there one that you find yourself always going to? Oh, if I have to pick between the three, the one that I probably go to the most is Link's Awakening. That was one of my first games on the Game Boy. I had an old, fat, black Game Boy I had bought from somebody ages ago when I was a kid. And I just played that game all the time. I know it almost as much as the back of my hand um, for the most part. And it just is something that always brings back a sense of adventure. I always recognize that Windfish tune, and it just brings back nothing but good memories. Yes. So it's it's good to see that like they're starting to bring that back to the Switch. It, so I'm they're, very they're pleased putting for that, that on the Switch, yeah, which is excited. awesome. Um, I, if I may, I also was happy to see in the trailer that they're sticking, even though they're not going screen by screen scrolling, they're sticking to the grid layout. Mm-hmm. They're not yeah. like reinterpreting the graphics. The the, the actual tiles the, that were sprites, yeah. they're honoring that, and I'm so pleased that that's happening. It's good to see a lot of games kind of sticking to that nowadays. Yeah. I mean, even Doom did that with uh, when they redid their new series. But so to see that Legend of Zelda is kind of following that vein and not doing a uh, complete overhaul is phenomenal, especially for that game. I like that they're honoring that. I agree. Maybe for something like Samus Returns or that Resident Evil remake that happened on the GameCube, reinterpreting it a little bit is okay. But for Mm -hmm. Link's Awakening, 
I want my grid. Uh, you know, I don't want it right. to be changed too much. No, no, and it's just great. Uh, the items in those games are also really phenomenal too. Yeah, I, I mean, agree. you get a lot of like uh, rocks feather, which is a neat item that's become a little more staple in some of the games. Yeah, and the Pegasus boots, of course, which you can't have. A legend is all about the Pegasus boots half the time. Speaking of the rocks feather, there's some. Uh guessing that they might map that up to a shoulder button for this remake, by the way, so that you don't have to always switch to it. I, I think I might prefer that. I would, I'd would i be okay with that. I think that in the case of adding things like maps or adding in items that are already hotkeyed to something, that's an okay addition to a game. Yeah. It's better for convenience, and it does better to not take away from you playing that. You don't have to pause it, swap items, and then re-go back to that. You I know? agree. I agree. That mechanic of only having two items on those Game Boy games to this day does inhibit the experience, but you just tolerate it. Because you just Absolutely. know, I only have two action buttons. This is how it has to be. Mm -hmm. Well, now on the Switch, if there are a few extra buttons, I think that might be the right choice. Right. I, I'm hoping that they will update a few of the things that I do find annoying from that game. Oh, tell me. Um, a good example would be that uh, I believe it's the uh, like Giants bracelet that you get in one of the dungeons. And if you don't... It, <laughs> If it's not equipped properly, when you go up to touch pots or things, it pauses to tell you that you can't lift it up. And that's great, but if I'm accidentally running some direction because I'm trying to get away from a monster or go into another room and I bump an object wrong, and next thing you know, I'm pausing and I have to read that I can't pick this up. That's great and fine and dandy, but <laughs> it gets really old after the fifth time you accidentally do it. I agree completely, completely. Every time that message comes up, there's a big fat eye roll from, from me. It's like, oh, I get yeah. it. I know, it's I like, know. Uh, <laughs> I know, game. I know. I see. Interesting. So how do you feel about Minish Cap then, actually? Uh, Minish Cap I actually really do enjoy. Yeah. I think that was a title that doesn't get as much respect as it as it should. I agree. Um, because it's from around that Wind Waker time period. And some people don't like the style or the feel of those games. It's Legend of Zelda, so it's it's hard for me to point fingers at it. I feel that the style was appropriate for the time. I also do like the fact that you do get to see both different worlds by changing size. Yeah. You know, uh, it adds... It's something that a lot of Legend of Zelda games have. You go to the Shadow World, you deal with the regular world. You go into a Phantom World, you deal with the regular world. No. This one, you just deal with a size change. Right. You know, and... Um, I liked having a talking hat. I didn't mind it so much. <laughs> I mean, you know, he would always just uh, fill you in on stuff. And I mean, I don't know. It was it was good. And the graphics were great for its time frame. And the music is still really memorable. Yeah. So I just feel that it doesn't get as much uh, respect, you know, for that time frame. I see. I see. And that one translates very well to the Game Boy Player, by the way, because it already has. It did a little bit of that. I think it, they mapped roll to the R button, actually, now that if I, if I remember correctly. I think so, if I recall. And I mean, like, yeah, with, with that GameCube controller, it works great. Yeah, on the television. So you're here at the Midwest Gaming Classic this year, obviously probably largely for the experience, but are there any things you're on the hunt for, anything you're looking for from the vendors? Um, I already picked up some stuff. I've been looking at a lot of different Star Fox stuff currently. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, as far as it goes, I've got a lot of my, like, the Legend of Zelda stuff I already have at home, so I don't necessarily need more of that. Fair enough. Um, but then aside from that, I'm going to play some pinball games I've been looking forward to play, you know, every year. Yep. And uh, just hunting around in the arcade, see what I can find out, you know? I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of time over here. It was absolutely a pleasure to, to bump into you guys today. Yeah, absolutely, and good to see you here. Oh, say, you stream a bit, don't you? I do stream a bit, yes, that'd be Tell correct. Tell us where that is and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, so I stream on uh, Twitch, so it's going to be twitch.tv forward slash boss arcade. Um, as far as it goes, it's a channel where I play anything from new games, from PC, Xbox One, uh, the Switch, and PS4, all the way backwards to the original Nintendo. So you can find all kinds of different stuff on there. Um, and yeah, just check it out for a bit of fun. I love it. Fantastic. Yeah. Cool, dude. <laughs> I'll see you around still, but thanks oh, for being on absolutely. the show. Absolutely, and thanks for having me on the show. Indeed. Yeah, so that was that was really great to spend that time yeah. with Michael. Actually, that was huh. that was really cool. And later that day, uh, Carly came back around and she bought the show a little Zelda magnet. So I actually uh -huh. keep that up on our production desk. It's 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 very cool. It's a little you know sprite of um, original Link. That's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. She said, "Here, this is for you guys." And I said, "Oh, so so sweet." So then I think for some reason I was away from the booth for a little while because we... you interfaced with another podcast at yeah. this point. These are the beer boys. They gave me a beer. I think it might be, I think yeah. to get on the podcast. <laughs> that might have and happened. It, 
well, it definitely worked. Weren't they recording their podcast on the other side of the yes, room or yes. something? So we, we just went down the line, boom, 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 there's three of them, and mm-hmm. we're just going to play all three in a row. Stoy, Patrick, and Dan. You got it. And, and actually, if I remember, uh, after listening to the audio files, I wasn't present for some of this, but after listening to the files, you actually kept the recording going because, ah. because you might recall when you were speaking with Stoy for the first couple minutes, you didn't actually push record, my right. friend. Right, 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 right. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> there was so much good content that we don't have recorded because... I don't know what I'm doing. No, 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 no. It's all good. And so then, uh, so yeah, we'll just let's just play these back to back. Stoy, Patrick, and Dan, all the way. Okay. Okay. All right, Alex. Again, here at the Midwest Gaming Classic, we're just grabbing random strangers and making them talk about Zelda all day. And uh, right now, we have Stoy with us. And Stoy, welcome to the podcast. How you doing? Thank you for having us. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. So uh, we we were talking a little bit earlier, and we're going to talk about our favorite links through the Zelda universe. And what I want to do is I want to kind of split it up into. We'll call it canonical links in the the main timelines, of which there are two, maybe three, who knows? Yeah. Uh, And then the non-canonical links. So your Smash Brothers, your Mario Kart, your Hyrule Warriors. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'll I'll hand it over to you first. Who do we got up as your favorite link in the canonical universe? Uh, I talked to, uh, we were talking earlier before we hit the record button, how uh, my favorite canonical link. I want to pause because that's a very uh, generous way of saying I forgot to hit record the first time. I wasn't going to be the one to say (laughs) that, but that's okay. Uh, So... Uh, not my favorite canonical link is uh, the link from Link to the Past. That was my favorite link. Uh, that was my favorite Legend of Zelda out of all the Legend of Zeldas because literally talk about like getting woken up in the middle of the night, following your uncle, and then him telling you like, "Hey, you got to go rescue the princess. Here's a sword and shield. Go." You know? I, yeah, I, I love that about that link because yeah. like you, know, you look at games like Breath of the Wild and you look at Ocarina of Time and you're this this androgynous boy child who's woken up and you're sort of like kind of still out of it for a majority of the game and you don't know what's going on you don't know if you're into this or not but with with Link to the Past you can tell that that Link is just like he's sold from from the get go well yeah the moment you spin your sword and then the music changes I mean he's good to go yeah I mean he's he's, he's going he's ready to rock you know once you say like literally your first objective as a game is rescue the princess yeah I mean usually you don't see that till like the very end of any of the Legend of Zelda games that's kind of cool and I think that's where a lot of people get hung up myself and Included on Link to the Past is that first dungeon is it's it's you can get lost. It's a pretty big uh, area. It's a big temple, we'll call it. Yeah, for and, sure. Um, I think a lot of people fall off there, but you got to power through because this is one of the best games in the franchise. Yeah. Uh, listeners to the podcast will know that I don't think any of us really have gotten through it in the past several years, but I think we're all going to have to take another swing at it if it comes out for Switch. I've, I've, been, fingers I've crossed. been meaning to as well. It's Like I said, it's my favorite out of all of them, and I've been, you know, I think about it every now and then, and I'm like, I really want to, like, get back into it. Awesome. You know? So, uh, non-canonical Link, who do you have? This is controversial. Can I be controversial on this show? I don't know. Uh, okay, we, I mean, this is the nanny state on another Zelda podcast. Okay, you might get letters. Okay, all right. Well, if I get letters, I'll, I'll, I'll submit my I'm, I'm up for debate argument. My favorite non-canonical link is the Majora's Mask link. Oh. <laughs> oh, listen, listen, man. listen, listen. According no, to... No, according, no, no, hey, hey, hey. No, sir, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir, no, please, no, please, no. please, please, sir, you're scaring me. <laughs> it is reason getting why, hostile The reason here. why, the reason why, the full game is a dream. Okay, so it has you no don't bearing, believe that Link dies? It has no bearing. That, that, that's the... That's the hypothesis that I I follow is that literally in the beginning of the game, Link dies trying to find Navi, mm-hmm. and it's all some sort of like afterlife dream sequence. So it shouldn't have any bearing on the timeline because. Well, let me ask you this then. Okay. Um, if only the physical universe, let's call it the physical realm, is canon, uh-huh. how do you explain the sages? How do you explain the dark world? Okay. Is Zelda in the dark world of Twilight Princess right. not? Canonical Zelda? A non-canonical Zelda one. Well, even like like in uh, A Link Between Worlds, I forget the princess in the Dark World who twists the who twists the yeah, Triforce. I forget her name. I forget her name, yeah, but... So I guess in some instances she cannot be canonical. It's Hilda. Hilda. Hilda, that was it. Thank Hilda. you very much, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, it is kind of controversial, like I said, but I, I apply it to the theory that it was entirely a dream. And it has no bearing on the uh, Zelda universe at all. But I mean, if you want my real answer, if you want <laughs> my here? real Let's answer, hear. it's the Hyrule Warriors uh, Link. Why is that? Because he is, I just like his like story because he is just a normal Hyrule soldier. Mm. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah, And he's, you know, it was like basically like the beginning of the game starts where he's like training in the training grounds. And then Zelda like 
Like, who's that guy? Picks like, he looks line. like yeah, yeah. he's... And actually, now that I think about it, that, that kind of makes sense. That carries over into the main games, too. And mm-hmm. so I, I think... I like your second answer more. Okay, I, you know I understand. What? Since I understand. we own the podcast, that's what we're going to go with. Okay, cool. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> All enough. right. Stoy, thank you for talking to me. Is there anything you want to talk about on the show? Sure, yeah. Uh, I'm part of another uh, video game podcast called EXP Cast. Uh, yeah, we talk about video games and a bunch of other things. We uh, are, uh, we get new episodes drop every Tuesday, and uh, we record our episodes live on Twitch every Monday night. Um, you can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, everywhere. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Thank you for talking to us, Stoy. Thanks for and having us. EXP Appreciate it. Podcast is the podcast. We're going to talk to two of your other cohorts in a second here, so stay awesome. tuned. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks again. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to keep it rolling so I don't accidentally not press record. Who do we have now from EXP Podcast? My name is Patrick Klein. Patrick Klein? Yep. Klein. K-L- Klein? Yep. Klein. German. Nice. So yep. you got the, the Irish first name, the German last name. Exactly. You Which have a middle name? Pure American. James. <laughs> yep, you got it, buddy. <laughs> awesome. So I'm going to pose the same question. Uh, same two questions, I suppose. First, mm-hmm. what is your favorite canonical link? Second, mm-hmm. what is your favorite non-canonical link? And if you'd like, you could take that time to defend that the Majora's Mask young link is, in fact, canon. Well, I'm just going to say, you know, on the record here, Stoy has no clue what he's talking about. Okay. Yep. So, yep. So, Stoy was know. the one who famously said that Young Link in Majora's Mask is not canonical Link. No, and I say he is canonical. That is like, I believe that's the ending where he uh, kind of, where he beats Ganon and he chooses to go back in as a young kid uh-huh. again. Okay. And then that's his journey, you know, like he's doing a journey and of course Skull Kid takes the horse and, uh, you know... He chases him into that dark hole. There we go. And there you go. Now it's canonical link. So now we've got a one to one, one to one canonical versus non canonical. There's yep. a third chair on on your podcast, so maybe he'll break the tie for us. Yeah. So, uh, what, what is your favorite canonical link? My favorite one is actually Toon Link. Ah, so this our cell shaded friend who sails a ship and uh, mm-hmm. throws little bombs that puff up into a cell shaded puff of smoke. That little guy has so much personality. He's got a lot of personality. He's got the uh, he's got those eyes. They're very expressive. And the facial uh, the facial features like you can tell when like when his sister gets kidnapped and he's about ready to go on his journey and he sees his grandma. He's just about ready to tear up before he touches like uh, He's a sensitive little young man. Yes. And I think that part of the hero Part of the hero's story, there's always, of course, like the how strong can you get, how masculine, whatever. But uh, I think a, 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 the successful hero's journey's tales, uh, they all include some sort of emotional contingent. And, yep. and, and you can really see that in Young Link in uh, Wind Waker. Plus, you know, he's also like the most hilarious of them, too. Just because he has a cartoon, you can do things like shoot him across the world and have him hit a rising tower. You know, just a pure comic relief and a very tense, mo- tense moment. And more broadly in that game, who could forget our friend Tingle? Exactly. And he's got, like, little nephews or something. Like, uh, they've got mostly human names like Tom or something. I don't know. But Tom, Brad, I don't know. And, like, Knucklehead or something. I don't know. Yeah. Who's to say? Anyway, okay, so your favorite non-canonical link. You know what? I would say my favorite non-canonical is... Uh, Probably the one from Hyrule Warriors. Okay, same you know, reason. Where same it's just reason, sort of, you know, uh, he's he was the one when all the castle soldiers were running away from the castle invasion. He was the one that was running towards it. You know, okay, he was just a normal dude, just taking on his mission. He just, you know, I think that proved his courage and made him into the hero. You know, I like that too. A lot of the a lot of the appeal of these games is the immersion and. Who, how could you relate to someone more than just a standard guy in the line who gets selected to do something incredible? Yep. All right. Well, uh, that's two of the three. Again, that's EXP Podcast. They talk about video games. Yep. And you can find them on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. Everything that has podcasts, you'll probably find us. They do a Twitch stream as well, so make sure to tune into that. Monday nights, 7 p.m. Central. Monday nights, 7 p.m. Central. That's uh, yeah. twitch.tv. Oh, All right, we're about to interview. Again, thank you, Patrick. Thanks for talking to us. Thank you. Again, I'm not going to press stop because I'll probably forget to press record again. So, EXP Podcast, uh, you are the third host. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Call so, up. Yeah, whatever. How do you guys split it up? Do you guys, like, do one main guy or, like, do you just all talk at well, each other? Usually, or what do you uh, 
be kind of designated story as the Donatello or the no, yeah, the Leonardo of the group. But now we're kind of just rotating around once in a while. Like I'll I'll lead a he's he's over my shoulder right now, staring me down. No, yeah. but uh, <laughs> hey, how you? Doing? But uh, no, usually we rotate and all that, and we'll at least like take the helm. Great, yeah, yeah. I think that's like we we kind of try and do the same thing with these shows, especially in other Zelda podcasts. There's no one host. It's everyone kind of tries to bring something to the table. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. All right. Same questions. Who is your favorite canonical link? I got to I came here prepared to say Link's Awakening Link. Interesting. But the entire time I was listening to these guys, yeah, I was having a I was having a mental breakdown because then I was like, wait, Link's Awakening was the Windfish's dream. Is but, it all just a dream? But I was kind of thinking, wait, no, that wasn't a dream of Link. That was just a dream of the island itself. Right. So I was like, so Link did have that adventure, but I don't know. They leave well, you that, hanging. Then so. we get into like the question of like the nature of reality. Oh, God. Did yeah. it happen or didn't it happen? Even if it only happened in someone's mind, that's real or is it not? Who knows? God, so we're yeah, we're going to go with kills. Link's Awakening Link for the canonical oh, Link. Yeah, I'm going with that. Okay. But I think like... Um, I had a best design one. I like the Wind Waker link. Wind Wa- oh, so Wind Waker is one of those games, and uh, listeners to the pod will know that I do not like Wind Waker because there's a lot of time spent just sailing a boat. Yeah. Don't love it. Okay, so, yeah. but I will say the art style of that game oh, is amazing. Yeah. Well, that's the one thing that sold me on it was the art style, and then, like, you see a whole bunch of people that they poo-poo it because it's cell shaded looks like a child. Like, it's more kid-friendly and all that. Well, sure. But I'm like... I, I love cell shading. I love Okami and all that. I love, uh, what's that? There's another uh, cell shading game Street I really like. The latest Street Fighter had a little oh, bit uh, more stylized uh, cell shading. Oh, Street Fighter 4 did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they had the heavy outlines and yep. all that. Oh, yep. God. It was really cool. Yeah. And, um, all right, so, favorite non-canonical Link? Um, which ones are, con- which ones are so I'm gonna say I'm going to say Smash Brothers, uh, yeah. Mario Kart. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hyrule uh, Warriors. I will not count as a Zelda game. Oh, that's kind of tough because so I like um, there's like three links in Smash three links Brothers. In Smash Brothers, so I gotta say and then that, all the different just, outfits too because you have Dark Link for each one of them. I know. I gotta say, yeah, there's I gotta say the Smash Brothers one just because you kind of have that weird paradox where there's three really of them do. in one room and it's like who's who's who here? Three of them could all be fighting Zelda at once, and uh, the one is from a different dimension apparently because it's he's two D or like yeah exactly he's cell shaded and the others are all three D. All right, we've heard it twice before, but let's hear it again. What's your podcast? Where can people find it? <laughs> We're, uh, I, well, actually, I'm Dan from EXP Cast. I'm the third guy. Uh, yeah, we, we stream our podcast, 7 o'clock Central Time. Great. That sounds great. That's EXP Podcast. This was Dan. It was a pleasure talking to you. Hey, thank you. You too, man. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs> oh, man, that got a little wild for a little bit. They were, like, yelling back and forth to each other. I don't know if you recall, but... Um, I think the other two guys were maybe just playing the games, and they kept like chiming in. Yeah, they um, <laughs> they have their, they certainly have their flow down from that EXP podcast. Indeed, they. Uh, I'm not gonna say intrusive, but wow, I don't know. That's a hot take. Uh, hopefully, they're not listening. But I don't know. Maybe if perhaps they, they could, are. Uh, send me some more beer. I might have some more uh, favorable opinions. Oh my goodness, my goodness. Well, it was cool that you were able to meet up with them, and it was nice to hear their thoughts. I know I did see them across the way, and they recorded an episode as well. It might be fun to kind of seek that one out. So they did, they did a live episode at the at the con. Yeah, they did like a live. They were sitting at the table and recorded with a few other people. Um, and they had a banner as well, which was very nice. It was a cool looking thing. Was it um uh was it taller than ours? <laughs> or no? I, 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 I no, ours was, ours was taller. Yeah, so this, ours this, was like way taller. This isn't about um a, a bragging or anything. This is a Zelda podcast. <laughs> uh, so so at that point, then I had the wonderful opportunity to interview Walter Day actually, and that was really exciting. Todd Freeman, uh, Walter Day was helping Todd Freeman over at his booth, and um we had a. I guess a little break in Walter's schedule and he joined us for a little bit, but I did play that one already, Alex, in our first episode, my episode with John right at the end. I jumped forward in time a little bit because I thought it'd be fun to include that. Foreshadowing. Yeah. So, well, post shadowing, because it's happened already. It already, it happened in the Friday episode last week, Uh, which you have not heard yet because we're recording this before that one comes out. Uh, Just play the next (laughs) interview. (laughs) I think the Another Zelda podcast production timeline is more complicated than the Zelda timeline. It sure is. (laughs) So so I spoke to Walter. That was awesome. And then after that, actually, um, Scott Clark and company came by the booth. And Scott is someone that I interviewed. He's from The, the Gaming Outsider. And he, uh, we interviewed him in our Video Game Summit episode. 
So um, just to switch it up a little bit, Chris Owens is another person on that show. And I said, well, Scott, we've already chatted. Let's can I chat with Chris. And I had never met Chris in real life. So um, we now talked. Let's bring that one up. All right, here I am in the Another Zelda podcast booth with my next guest. I'm very excited. We have, well, why don't you tell my listeners who you are first and who you're with? Uh, my name is Chris Owens. I'm with the Gaming Outsider podcast. Fantastic. Chris, you and I met digitally through yes. cameras and screens um, when I was lucky enough to be a guest on your show. And we were happy to have you. That was a great episode. It was a real pleasure. I was very excited, to be honest. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so uh, I met um, some of your other podcast co-hosts yes at the absolutely. video game summit that's right last year some mm-hmm. of the, some of which are here again today but i never got a chance to speak with you um in person so here we are I, i'm i'm excited <laughs> to be here this is my second time here it's it's always always an event you know and uh, be able to, to network like this is really fantastic i i agree it's it's our first year with any kind of booth here i've come as a civilian i guess you could say a oh, couple times sure absolutely a couple times but um, for you the midwest gaming classic what is it for you that uh, makes it so special it's it's a gathering point for all the gaming community it's large, large small big tall it's we're all here we all have the same common interest it's it's a friendly environment it's we, we share things that nobody ever knew before like there are facts about games that i never knew there's peripherals i've never seen before that you just kind of boggle your mind somebody here actually has a world championship gold cartridge no sealed up and Wait, i was like i think i did see something like that on yes. twitter it's is it in this room it's in the room <laughs> we are in its presence you, you just tingle i'm you looking around ting- right now oh you just tingle in the feeling there it's amazing awesome it's just just just, just the ambiance of the whole genre is here and it's it, it takes your breath away sometimes it really does once in a while video game collectors who collect retro games say oh i just search it on amazon and i buy it or i search it or whatever and fine there's some truth to that but when you're able to kind of go old school and really come together as a community and literally be in aisles and hallways with other people that love video games it is special isn't it if i may it really is because i mean it, the, the debate goes on forever of physical versus digital especially now in the current gen world yeah but here it's so much different because you're one-on-one with the with the gaming experts you're one-on-one with the merchandisers those that are kind enough to barter with you do so you get more bang for your buck if you ask me if you just kind of bring things together and know what you're paying for yeah it's just that sense of community that I think is lacking in such a social media heavy world that really sparks that in an environment like this, and it's really special. I agree. I agree. There's a nuance or something that happens when Absolutely. you're with people. You, know? you can't get that on Amazon. You can't get it on eBay. You have to get it one on one with human interaction. I agree. I agree. And and we as another Zelda podcast are very excited to. We're kind of newbies, but we're very excited to be part of the community. Um, is there anything that you're looking for in particular today at the Midwest Gaming Classic? Well, I, it's anybody that listens to the Gaming Outsider. Knows I'm a huge Mega Man fan, so I'm kind of starting my collection. I don't know if my wife listens. I'm being gentle, I promise. <laughs> uh, it's it, I, and I'm seeing so many things. I'm seeing box copies. I'm seeing figurines. I'm seeing things from Mega Man. Some things from Mega Man X. There are rare collectibles out there. That's what. It doesn't matter what genre you're in, whether it's Zelda, whether it's Mega Man, whether it's anything in the gaming world you can get. You can find something, and it's something like the MGC where that's always possible. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to, since we're on another Zelda podcast, since we're on a Zelda podcast, do you um, have a particular Zelda game that sticks out for you that you enjoy, a, a, you know, a favorite game or a first game or anything like that? You know, it's funny you mentioned that. Just a couple of weeks ago, I beat the original Legend of Zelda for the first time. Nice, nice. And I was <laughs> just playing on my classic. I just spun it up and it started going well, going well. I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> something I never did as a kid was actually beat the original. So it was really cool about that. Ocarina of Time, I think, is my overall favorite. Yep. My favorite final fight is Twilight Princess. Yes, uh, it is good. Zelda versus Ganondorf. That is, I mean, excuse me, Link versus. Oh, <laughs> oh gonna, my oh, gosh, it oh, happened. Man. It I'm, happened. It did, and I'll catch myself. I'm so sorry. Link <laughs> versus Ganondorf, of that course. final fight is. Maybe it's in my top five of video games of all time as far as final boss fights. Yeah, and as actually as a little bit of a deep cut to that fight for a little while, it is actually Zelda versus Link in a way, Very isn't true. it? Very true, yes, yes. <laughs> Go get Zelda first, then Ganon, then Ganondorf off horseback. It's yeah. The, 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 the progression, I mean, the final fight is like it for me, but the progression between Demon Zelda and Ganon and then going to that final fight, it's... It's incredible. I, I play it as much as I can. Our season one finale was an episode just about Ganon. Yep. And, and essentially, so it essentially became the Ganon fights. And we went through as many games po- as possible. And I spent 
I, I think, a third of the episode just talking about the Twilight Princess Ganon slash Ganondorf fight. Oh, I know why. It makes sense. It's amazing. It's a, such a good balance yes. of all the different things. And the fact that it kind of st- starts, you could say, big and it gets smaller. So by the end, it's just two, two cre- you know, humanoid it's creatures. Just, it's just two opposing so, forces uh, one on one. Yeah. So cool. Mm-hmm. So cool. So, yeah, I agree with you on that one. Um Interesting. Favorite fight. So uh, Ocarina is probably the favorite for you. That's a lot for a lot of people. It was a it's a seminal, you know. It's the turning point. I yeah. think it's when it really. I mean, the original is fantastic. Two has its niche. Link to the Past, fantastic. This was when Mario sixty four came out. They like the entire, I would say, horizon expanded incredibly. And when Ocarina of Time came out, I'm like, we're rolling. This yeah. is the gen that's going to really take this thing off, and it has. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, well, then I must ask, since it uses the same engine, how do you feel about Majora's Mask? Never played. Okay, fair enough. Never played. It's a. It just. I don't know if I just didn't get around to it. I was. I was in college at the time, and things. You know, other things are happening. You know, would I like to go back and play? Yes, it definitely has some odd intricacies. I yes. would say with the clock and with other you know, mechanics of the game. I know it's very similar to Ocarina as to how it plays, but. Just to kind of see what it's all about. I've heard so much about it for, what, 20 years now? Yeah. It's time to go in and really see it for myself. I tell you, we're doing a Majora's Mask review episode next season. It might be fun to have you join us as a first impressions kind of thing or something. I think I'll have to kind of get my hands on it and play and do that. I think that'd be be fun. I've played through Majora's Mask twice in my life, so not too often. You know, It's not a particularly long game. There's only four dungeons. Yes. And... um, the first time I played it, I was all in because for me it was just more Ocarina enough. Yes. When it first came out. Oh yeah. The second time I played it, I was kind of like, I don't know if I like this or not because <laughs> I had played now Wind Waker and Twilight Princess and all these things. And when you go back to it with a different context, I wasn't sure if I enjoyed it. It's kind of hard to go backwards like that. A even, little bit. Even in Zelda, in the Zelda world, it's true. It's true. Like for example, the very first The Legend of Zelda when you were just playing, it took me weeks to get used to not being able to walk on an angle on a <laughs> diagonal. Like just I kept it would, he would just stair step left. There was right, a lot right. I was trying to get used to on that. The, the, <laughs> That's fair. The, the, the single dot map system. I mean, come on. I, know. I wouldn't make it anywhere anymore. Why is it even there? It that just is like, it doesn't make sense. It gives you a reference of where you generally are in some kind of space, but it doesn't mean anything. Oh, my red dot's over on the left. What does that mean? You know That's what I mean? right. Oh, go to the river. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Um, so Ocarina Majora's Mask. So yeah, Majora's Mask is, if Ocarina, if I may, if Ocarina is a beautiful classic landscape epic painting Majora's Mask is kind of an odd impressionist painting in an art gallery to the side I've gotten that feeling so we we'll talk about reviews and folks that have played the game and talk about that yeah. I get I get that I get that idea so but it, it, it intrigues yeah. me enough to go back and like I said to see how it translates for me in that aspect because I, I from what I've seen and know I would agree but I really had to get into it to know to know for sure I would say that going into it with that perspective of knowing that it's it's a little bit of a love letter it's very emotional so it's beautiful in that way sometimes it's aesthetically a little uglier than Ocarina but we don't oh, have to yeah. get into it absolutely um, but with that said then that was you know IG Anuma's first real directorial debut and of course now he's kind of leading the ship with Skyward Sword and Breath of the Wild may I ask you what your thoughts are on Breath of the Wild I thought it was the swan song. I really did. Yeah. I thought it was the Ninth Symphony, whatever other metaphors you want to put out there. Yeah. I thought the final fight was a disappointment. I, agree I thought completely. that was man. I thought after all that you went through to make it and try as even fight as possible, it just was. I could have done less and done the same thing. It's it's really it really it didn't ruin the game for me because there's enough in the game that it's you're you're engaged, intrigued. There were nights I stayed up till four in the morning, yep. not even looking at the clock. I just wanted to go on and see what happens next. And there's still so much to see and do. I know I need to go back and do that, but just the ending, it came real close to end uh, to ruining for me. It really I did. Agree. Over, otherwise, absolutely beautiful game. Yeah, I agree completely. That is definitely for better or for worse a about the journey, not about the end kind of game. Yes. And I will say, even as I played it, I kind of got that sense, I think, as most people do. You're kind of like, go save Zelda, but actually spend 200 hours doing all this other stuff if you want. (laughs) And then when I got to Ganon, I was like, so kind of a weird Resident Evil knockoff. And then, I mean, in that actual, I mean, Ganondorf or whatever that thing is, Calamity. (laughs) Calamity Ganon, yeah. But when actual Ganon, Ganon, Pig Ganon shows up, you have to try to get hurt. Like, it's not a battle. No. You know what I mean? It's shoot at four or five targets. That would oh, I I it, it, the listeners can't see me scratching my head or beating my head right now. But it's when I saw that at the end, I just kind of went, uh, uh, another light arrow. Okay, we're yeah. done. 
That was like, really? That's how you end it? Come I on. Agree. That's one of, if not the worst, final fight in Zelda history, in my Certainly opinion. Certainly underwhelming. Polar opposites of Twilight Princess. Very much. Yeah. Very much. Oh, so well, since we're doing this, and since you're familiar enough with video games in general, I mean, that's the case with many people here, but um, I'd like to ask you... We all know that a Breath of the Wild sequel is being made. IG Numa said that it's using the same engine, so it's a little bit of maybe an Ocarina of Majora's Mask thing. I don't know if it'll be that different, but it's definitely using the same engine. Right. Um, what would you like to see in a Breath of the Wild sequel? Or, 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 in other words, the next Zelda game? Well, I'd like to see... Hmm, that's a very good question, actually, because uh, up until the final, I think Breath of the Wild did everything very much right. Yeah. I think, I think the... The way things respawn after, what, four or five game days or yes. whatever, I think they need to do a little bit different that. I know. I understand that you can't just, you know, knock everything out and have a desolate world to walk through anymore. That just gets redundant. But I think they need to find a better way to inter, uh, to weave that into yeah. the into how you progress and how you play the game. Yeah, yeah, I, you're right. Like, if it was geographically based, like, if you go into an area and defeat an area, that doesn't, that clock doesn't reset until you leave, you know, maybe it's something like that, where yeah. it's the way footsteps are left in the sand on a character, yeah. but on a no larger scale. And I have no problem with the, even the old school days when you kind of leave a room and then come back after a while and things are there. Yeah. That's fine, but you don't have to put in a blood moon, <laughs> everything, oh, by the way, everything just spawned up. That that was kind of, that, that was silly. I mean, it really was silly to kind of see that's how they thought they were clever enough to make that happen, you know? But I will admit, the it, first time that that cutscene happened, I was like, ooh, this is so cool. And by the second time that cutscene happened, I was like, I get what you're doing. It, move just along. move along. I mean, <laughs> you could just do the blood moon and just move on, you know? Trim the fat on that. That's something yeah. that you, you don't have to... I don't want to say that they were... What do you want to say? Um, not plagiarizing. Not plagiarizing. Uh, mocking the player or something that affect uh, that... Oop, sorry, no, you're <laughs> That... We get it. We're smart enough to know what's happening. So just like you said, just do a little bit, move on, and we can keep playing and join yeah. the join the world. You know, you don't. It's fluff. You don't need that fluff in there. I my final question. This is a this one might be tough as well. It's again about a Breath of the Wild sequel. I figured out a way to kind of rephrase it. Clearly, Ganondorf is not in Breath of the Wild. You no. know what I mean? <laughs> yes. A force of nature called Calamity something or other is in there, but it's not even really a character. Right. I've thought about this a lot, and I don't know what the answer is. How could Ganondorf fit into a Breath of the Wild open world type structure? Like, is he an AI character that's moving around like a Dark Samus thing, or is it, or is it something different? Is he? How could Ganondorf? Maybe it's just the narrative. Like, I don't know. What do it's, you think? It could be something as simple as the narrative, but he's he's also a sorcerer. Yeah, and we all know how power. I mean, there's sorcerers in every genre of the world, fantasy or otherwise, that it is fit in there somewhere, and he could be, you know gotten so powerful after being dormant for so long that he's just, you know, kind of built himself up to be in, a, in control of this world. That's something similar they did with uh, Ocarina of Time. Yeah. That he was able to do that over a seven-year span between Link transporting between worlds. You're that's right. not out of the realm of context to do that. And in, 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 a, in a Zelda universe, that's possible. And then somehow he can manifest himself back into the world. It, it, yeah. it can happen. Yeah. I, and it wouldn't be far-fetched. It would work. Because we expect it as Zelda gamers. So if it's clever enough to happen to pull it off, it would work. I just now realized that, yeah, that's the answer. If it could be the Breath of the Wild game with the Twilight Princess ending and maybe a little bit of Ganondorf peppered in, I'd be Ooh, pretty happy. I'd be pretty man. happy. I'm salivating already. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us here. Oh, thanks for bringing me on. I can't on. wait you for bet. the episode to come out and uh, for future projects that I'm sure we will um, line up for. You bet. Absolutely. Right. Cool, dude. Thank you. Thank you. So that was Chris Owens. It was nice to meet him in person. That Not was actually really cool. Club. Not, no, Cartridge Club is our next thing. Our next. Uh, so Sorry. actually, my story next is kind of odd. There was a gentleman who. So as I was at the event, I was always kind of trying to sniff out people that could be potential interviews. So if I saw anybody wearing like a Zelda shirt or some kind of Zelda iconography, a hat or something with with a symbol on it. I would honestly kind of go up to them and say, hey, guys, oh, there's a booth up here or over here. Yeah. We're, we're talking about Zelda stuff. If you come by, let's chat. I remember even trying to bribe your nieces with Doritos to go do that legwork for us. Oh, yes, As on Sunday. As I understand Sunday. it, they, they weren't that interested, so we still kind of had to go around and find the hats and the shirts and the shoes. But I can ask them about that on our next episode a little bit, what it was like asking people to come do interviews. Mm -hmm. But I do remember that uh, my niece, Kira, she had the postcards in hand. She was ready to go. Oh, she, she was, was like, fine, I will there. do it. She stepped out into the aisle, and I think like an ocean of reality <laughs> washed over her. And... um. 
Uh, um, <laughs> well, you can only imagine how intimidating hundreds of people walking by the might be giants. when you're a nine-year-old. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So anyway, uh, so this gentleman, I saw him with his Zelda shirt, fine, whatever. And hours went by. And he was kind of walking near our booth, and I just thought I was—I had already asked many people because you're just kind of poking around, seeing who who you might find at an event like this. Some of the people are basically celebrities. Some of the people you're just pulling normal people out of the world, and that's kind of what's nice about a situation like this. So this gentleman who goes by uh, his handle is Musty Hobbit on Twitter. He's already tweeted us. He already appeared. Oh. Oh no, no, no. Yeah, he already appeared in one of our episodes as listener feedback, but that episode's coming out after this one. But Kate and I recorded it this previous weekend. Uh huh. Hence, follow so far. The another Zelda I podcast. I don't need my cue cards yet. I don't need my my grid of cue cards with the world drawn <laughs> meticulously on it, finding all the the secrets in each. Oh, cell. that's what we got to do. We got to get Jordan's brother on as a production manager for go. another Zelda podcast. There we go. Mm-hmm. Coming I'm together. Thinking it's coming together. So uh, I had a conversation with Musty, Musty Hobbit, and he is involved with a podcast called the Cartridge Cl- Cartridge. Cl- club and it just happened to be that the, so it's a cartridge club like a book club mm-hmm. they let their listeners know which game they're playing they do an episode a month or so they might do filler episodes in the middle but they do an episode a month uh where they review or basically have a book club about a game kind of neat kind of a cool little idea Very neat. yeah for those of us who don't read <laughs> play games <laughs> and it just happened that they were doing zelda 2 that month. Now that episode, that Zelda 2 episode came out about a week ago as of this recording, and I listened to it, and it was a pleasure. It was a really nice episode to listen to, so I recommend it. Maybe we'll try to add some links or do some tweets, but here we are, all rewinding all the way back to me meeting Musty Hobbin. Let's do it. All right, I am here with our next guest, and actually, I'm going to make this kind of part of the interview here. I'm jumping into this one super cold. I don't even know your name yet. Who are you? So I go online uh, by Musty Hobbit. Okay. Uh, I have a YouTube channel uh, called Second Breakfast that I put together, and then I'm also part of uh, an online community called the Cartridge Club, and uh, it's like a book club for games, uh, and it's wholly ironic that you came up to me uh, to talk because we're playing Zelda 2 this month uh, well, as, our, great. as our game of the month for this uh, for the club. So Fascinating. Well, I mean, honestly, I just saw you wearing a Zelda shirt, essentially. Yeah. A couple hours later, I passed you again, and you're wearing a Zelda shirt, and I had some downtime, and I thought, I don't even know who this guy is, but yeah. he's like Zelda enough that I think I can get an yeah. interview with him. Oh, yeah, I sure. had no idea it was going to be such a rewarding <laughs> venture. There we go. Yeah. It, so, timing talk, is good. Can you talk to me a little bit more about the Cartridge Club? Because I think this is really yeah. cool. Um, so the Cartridge Club has been going for going on six full years at this point. We're yeah. in our sixth season. Um, initially created by a couple of guys in Nova Scotia okay. who just wanted a reason to talk about uh, Final Fantasy IV with each other and then some friends. Um, and so it, it became this uh, uh, in sort of the era before YouTube kind of evolved into something different. Like okay. They sort of started there. They had a lot of friends uh, in, in that community and uh, yeah, Link to the Past was episode one. And Amazing. So, uh, and so they they uh, carried on. They have since handed over the reins to myself and then my co-host. Um, and so we're uh, trying to play a Zelda game every year. And this was oh our gosh. first opportunity. Um, so we decided that we wanted to uh, look at the black sheep in the series, and that is Zelda 2. So, yes, yes. Yeah. I had an interview earlier today with um, a gentleman who... I ended up kind of agreeing with him quite a bit, but he loves Zelda 2, yeah. The Adventures of Link. And for certain reasons, and as he made his case, he wasn't being he wasn't being a politician about it. He was speaking passionately mm-hmm. and realistically, but I was kind of like, that's right, I do like that part about it. Oh, yeah. that's right, I do like that part about it. Yeah. Difficult game, though. I think it the, is very challenging. The biggest thing with Zelda 2 is, okay, fine, they... St- Oh, you get these items as you progress to make the game easier, but the trade-off then it means that the game's really hard in the beginning mm-hmm. <laughs> until you get some of these skill sets built up. Yeah, it can be, and it's interesting timing because the Switch version, uh, the Switch NES one, just released their SP version. So we have people in the club this this month who are trying it for the first time and are skipping some of the crunch and the oh. the, the grind from the beginning, um, which has been good because I I feel like people have a hard time approaching the first the the first non-traditional yeah. Zelda. Although at that time, it wasn't non-traditional. I was I was aware of the original The Legend of Zelda as a kid, but I didn't really experience The Legend of Zelda until, you know, sleepovers would happen, and yeah. that was usually Zelda 2. And at the time, I didn't actually even fully understand that it was the sequel. Yeah. 
I actually was kind of, you could say, first introduced to Zelda at being a side scroller. Mm -hmm. To the point where until fourth or fifth grade, I kind of thought like, yeah, yeah, you know, Zelda, that's mm -hmm. side scroller. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, let me ask you a little bit about, so the Cartridge Club is doing Zelda 2, but do you have a personal favorite game? I, it's a tough one. It like, is. The, the, there is. And there is no right answer. I. Uh, it's like asking always... what's your favorite song. It's like, well, what mood am I in? Exactly. Uh, for me, I, I think I always gravitate toward the original. Uh, that was always my first exposure. It was this unique uh, game that expanded beyond a single screen and, uh, and you know, the gold cart. And, like, there's just, I'm so steeped in nostalgia for that game yeah. uh, that that was really my, it's so, like, rooted in my fandom that that's, that that's, that's got to be it. Yeah, very good. Um, let's see. Let's see. What's something... Let's do this. Since we're talking about some of the oddballs of the series, the series, do you have any thoughts or opinions on Majora's Mask? You're gonna, you're gonna despise me for a second. I haven't played oh, Majora's that's, Mask. That's yeah. fine, but that's also part of the culture. That's one of those games that a lot of times people kind of skip. You mm -hmm. know, it is an odd offshoot of Ocarina. It's the same engine yeah. as, and yep. everything. We all know that. It's only four dungeons, though. Playtime's still pretty long, but it's mostly because you're doing a lot of overworld stuff. Mm -hmm. I would say that it is kind of a beautiful game. It's very artistic. It's like strangely, I guess. Strangely beautiful. Yeah, I, I have a lot of friends who. I have a friend who is a N64 uh, enthusiast, to say the least. Yeah. Uh, and he really likes Majora's Mask. Uh, in fact, that was another game that the club has played at one point. We did. We did play that. We haven't played Ocarina yet, and we're going to play that next year, I think. Spoiler alert for season seven, but we're in the middle of our ocarina. Well, we're about to do our ocarina review episode right oh, now, cool. so we're, I'm like pushing through Spirit Temple right now for the. Oh, nice. I mean, it's like the seventh time I played the game or something, yeah. but but try, we truly try to place all the way through for each very review cool. episode that we do. That's very good. Um, how do you? I'm I'm honestly a little bit more curious about your show. How do you structure your podcast and stuff? Can I ask about that? Yeah. Um, so a lot of the time we so we've been doing a lot of changes because one of the things about taking over for another host who had done five years worth of podcasting is that, is that we've had, we've had to kind of take what they had put down as a structure and find ways to make it uh, more adaptive, uh, ad adapted to us so that it's, it's not just us playing, putting on their clothes right. and, and acting as them. Because it's so, not authentic. You have to have exactly. it come from a real place. Exactly. Uh, and we're still trying to figure some of that out. Yeah. Um, we usually try to find as our guests one super fan and one newcomer. Love it. Uh, but we uh, we have, have started. Uh, I do a little bit of an intro. I just kind of write up a two or three minute quick blurb that sounds like a, it's a radio edit type of, of thing. Yeah. And then we flow right into... Uh, we've started flowing right into their actual like review, like overall feelings of the game before we get into the details because we used to and they used to lead with first impressions, right? And I think we found that first impressions on a lot of a lot of games that we've chosen. We've chosen some very like we played Catherine this earlier this season, yep. and uh, first impressions in some cases are all the same like a lot of people just kind of have the same yeah i heard about it it was interesting or it wasn't interesting yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so by leading with our we lead with our overall thoughts and we flow into i kind of just let the conversation take us yeah I, uh, we try and uh if it's a story-based game we usually will tend to walk people through the story but um just to give some context and whatnot yeah yeah set it up to give context of graphics and um Say, do you guys record in the same space, or do you do like Skype recording, like Google so the, Hangout? So the club is multi-continental at yes. this point. So we Got have it. we have a couple guys in Europe and a few in Asia, but um, we use uh, Google Hangouts through YouTube, and we have the sh we we actually are going to start broadcasting the recording of the show live nice. with an audience uh, on YouTube. Uh, but then taking that audio out of there, which has its own challenges and some things that I wish would be better. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but taking that out and then editing that down for, for audio. So uh, I see. That's that's how we do it for the most part. But we we, we like the, you know, uh, we have people who try and keep up on the forums and we've got Discord and all of that. You know, every other way you can possibly communicate nowadays. Yes, of and, course. Uh, and, and that's how we kind of keep the conversation running throughout the month but then but then yeah it all kind of comes to a head and comes together for that for that show at the end 
fascinating. Since yeah. you like the uh, original so much or have such yeah. fond memories of it, everybody is aware of the fact of, of the point I'm about to make, but I must ask then, what is your interpretation of Breath of the Wild? How do you feel about Breath of the Wild? Since it is kind of so much thought of, yeah. it's considered to be the, uh, what what Zelda could have been back in the early 80s is what it was, and what it, you know, thematically what it could be mm-hmm. now is what it is. How do you feel? I... I really enjoyed Breath of the Wild. I did not go to the lengths that some did to experience everything. In fact, it's pro- it would probably be worth me going back through some point. Yeah. Like a year from now, two years from now, and, and actually playing through it again. Because um, I kind of... I kind of fast-tracked it. Uh, right, right. Like, like I went through it in probably about 40, 40 hours or yeah. so, and so I skipped a lot. I'd say 40 hours is hit staying on the main threads, for yeah, sure. yeah. I, I definitely found my path and and stuck to it, but um, what I I think it's a masterpiece of a game. Yeah, I really hope that they do a Majora's Mask to Breath of the Wild. But um, I agree, and I mean, there's indications that that's happening. Yes. IGN Numa has said that the the sequel in quotes yeah. will use the same engine at least. They're going to use great. the same engine That'd mechanics, and I'm all for it. Yeah, what I what I I think. With regards to the scope of what the NES was capable of, yeah, uh, I think that I think there is a lot of parallel. Uh, I agree. And I, I, there was there was talk of that eight bitified version of Breath of the Wild. I really want to see that. I really want that. Yeah, it's I want to play that. I'm like, in. Like put that on your online service. Yes, and like give a, give us something that's that type of exclusive, and people will flock. To like, but. I agree. That would be a, a special treat for sure. Absolutely. It's the same way that people have dug up the Battle System Zelda from, yes. the, you know, that was on the Nintendo technically, that mm-hmm. they would download it or whatever. Yes. Or no, stream it, I think. Technically, it was a stream thing. Yep. It was a little weird. But, um, yeah, it would be neat to see those little artifacts surface for people to interface with. Mm-hmm. As a, mm-hmm. And as you mentioned, as... as part of the service on the Switch, I think that's a perfect forum for that kind of thing. You don't need to box it up and put it on a shelf. Just have it be part of the service. That would yeah. be... It's like, it's the it's the bonus features on the second DVD, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Or it's the Star Fox 2 on your SNES Classic. Exa- yeah. Yes, well said. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Cool. I mean, if people want to find more information about what you guys are doing. Yeah. Is there a link or something that they could, uh, yeah. or a URL that they could check out? The best location to find the Cartridge Club is at cartridgeclub.org. There it is. Uh, you can also check us out on Twitter uh, as a club at Cartridge Club NA, North America. And uh, and yeah, we we have a, a number of other content creators that are all kind of nested within the club. We, yeah. we do try and do what we can to help elevate uh, individuals and so we uh, but again it all centers around this this sort of concept of a game of the month as uh, as something that we drive everyone to be a part of I love it now do yeah. you uh, w- let your audience know which game is coming up so that they can yes. play it and be a part of that experience we usually are th- anywhere from three to six months planned out uh, me and my co-host actually have all of uh, our seasons roll over in September, so we have all of next season for the most part locked down yeah. between us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we we have a spot on our forums that has a, a layout of the games that are coming. Uh, for example, uh, May we are playing uh, Shenmue. Yep, the first one. Uh, and in June we're playing Uncharted Two, and in July we're playing Batman: Arkham City. City, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I tell you what, this is not an official contract or anything, but next yeah. season we are reviewing Majora's Mask. Okay. I wonder if seven, eight, nine months from now we could lightly parallel the two experiences. That could be really fun. We could, as, we could as podcast friends, we, could, we should do that. I think that'd be a great yeah, idea. We should do that. And maybe we could have a little bit of crossover. But even just having it happen at the same time would be really rewarding. Yeah. I feel. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much for yeah, for joining me and giving me a little bit of time here in our episode. Yeah. Uh, that was. All I saw was a Zelda shirt, and right. we actually got like a really great interview out of it. Well, so that you. was a real treat. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, for sure. Cool, man. So kind of cool, right? Yeah, that yeah. sounds great. I mean, it's, it's kind of what, what we're doing here at AZP with the, the Discord, the multiple channels. Well, it's kind of what itself. AZP's becoming, yeah, if yeah. I may. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Having, having the group kind of come in and, and, and chat about having the listeners be a part of it, which it seems like is certainly the case with Cartridge Club as well. And if it works, I'm fine stealing that method from them. <laughs> I don't... Season three, we're uh, doing, we're, we're reviewing a game a month and it's ever going to, it's going to be called, oh no. Oh gosh, the tagline, the tagline's getting a little bit long. Yeah. What was the, it was a sloppy, <laughs> sloppy, sloppy, goosey, Lucy, sloppy, sloppy, Lucy, sloppy, Lucy, Goosey. And now we're already, uh, uh, another Zelda podcast, season three, 
steal the Cartridge Club's ideas. There it is. That's good. That's good. It's I like more that. Concise. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Can't, I can't do all the work here, Dave. Uh, but <laughs> I'm, I'm more than happy to give you a couple ideas. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I certainly appreciate those ideas. Um, next, uh, Aiden and Todd, as I spoke about just as we were coming in from the break or leaving for the break, whatever it was. These two gentlemen, uh, it's Todd and his son, Aiden. They're very near and dear to my heart because when we first started Another Zelda podcast, Todd was one of the first people that we interfaced with setting up our first booth. Went back when the show was just a little baby podcast, and it's it has it, it is by no means enormous now, but it has grown so much, and I'm so proud of it that it's I'm really taken with that growth. And Todd has kind of been there through it all with us a little bit, even a bit just by accident or just logistically. He and his son have been uh, friends with us, so I'm I'm talking with Todd right now about setting up. Pardon me, setting up a live show at the Video Game Summit 19, which will be coming up in a couple months. It looks like we're going to be able to do Water Temples. It looks like we're going to be able to have a small live show at the event. Maybe it'll just be a couple people in the crowd, but it'll still be live. And it looks like that's coming together, Alex. I'm very that's excited exciting. about that. So maybe I'll do a quick plug real quick. If Because it looks like we're going to be able to do this. We're definitely, another Zelda podcast will definitely be at the Video Game Summit 2019 uh, in Chicago. Um, technically a little bit west of Chicago, but you could find it by, by Googling it. Um... It's coming, it's it's July 7th, I believe, or, or give or take a day. So it's about a month away from this recording, and it's 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 very inexpensive to get in, and I would invite anybody listening who lives in the Chicago area right now to come to the Video Game Summit, because not only will we be there as a booth with games to play and ways to hang out, but it looks like maybe in the afternoon, early afternoon, we will be able to do a live show. And I'll do more official promos for this. Right coming but uh i was just emailing with him just the other day and it looks like it is coming together so i'm very excited about that okay 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 get your tickets while the getting's good there's a few tickets left video game summit just west of chicago you heard it here (laughs) probably third or fourth (laughs) i don't know i'm great i'm I'm loving it i'm I'm into this this is a this is a a it's turning into a goofy episode here where lucy goosey is a preview for what's to come baby (laughs) right so let me cue up this interview with aiden i chatted with aiden and then of course i uh, chatted with todd and there it is and then we just have one quick tiny little interview at the end of that and then we're calling it a day here. calling it a day Mm -hmm. so here's aiden Okay, I am here with my next guest, who is a returning guest, you could say, Aiden Friedman. How are you? Good. And, um, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Now, we last chatted um, back at the Video Game Summit in Chicago yes. in uh, 2018, which was another Zelda podcast's entry into the expo environment, I guess you could say. Yeah. It was a real pleasure. You help head that up. I see you have a VGS hat on right now, which yeah. is super cool. Uh-huh. And um, why are... This might sound weird, but why are you at the Midwest Gaming Classic today? Well, I'm mainly here because, uh, you know, like my dad uh, comes here every year. Yeah. But uh, and it's just really fun to come. And I just love the experience of like all the expos and stuff. It is cool. It is cool. We certainly had a good time at the Video Game Summit and we're very excited to be here as well. Our boots a little bigger, and yeah, actually, this is the booth we're bringing to you guys next year. We're oh. very excited about that. All right. Um, but you have a booth down the way here too. I noticed. Yes. I believe it's for your for your magazine. Isn't yeah. that right? How's that going today? What's uh, it like running a booth? It's good. It's really fun to like get behind the scenes for uh, the Midwest Gaming Classic, and uh, it's just yeah. Yeah, cool. So, actually, let's talk about the magazine a little bit. Um, I enjoy it very much. Mm. What um. What are some of the biggest challenges for running a magazine like that, for putting something like that together, in your in your opinion? Uh, mainly it's, like, just staying in business and also, like, putting your name out there. Yeah. Uh, that's That could be one of the reasons to, like, that, that is hard. Do you ever have a hard time getting the articles written, you know, people write them on time or getting stuff filled in on time? Is that ever a stress or uh, does that work out pretty well? It's pretty it, pretty, it works out pretty well considering the magazine only comes out every other month. Yeah, fair enough. I guess that's a good pace. Yeah. And you probably have people that are really excited to be a part of it, I'm sure. So yeah. I'm sure they hit their deadlines. Uh-huh. Excellent. What's What are some of the most rewarding experiences for, for running a magazine like that for you? Uh, personally, I just like being in it and um, it's just the experience of writing the reviews. Yeah. Have you had a favorite review in the last couple months that you've written? Um, uh, no, I can't really say favorites because I love, I like them all. Love it, nice, yeah. nice. Any any particular games that really stood out for you then that you reviewed? Uh, probably one of them. It was a couple months ago, but it was Nint- Nintendo Labo. When I first reviewed that, that was really fun. Did you review the which which pack? I guess you could say. Did you review? Uh, I think it was the first one actually. With the steering wheel or like the robot yeah. stuff? Uh, I think it was the one the steering wheel. Yeah. Cool. 
Nice. Yeah, yeah. I just saw in the news the Labo VR now just got yeah, introduced. I, yeah, I saw about. I heard that. About, heard about that. That'll be neat. It's kind of like the Google thing where they do the cardboard Google and you put the phone in there. Yeah. But I think that'll be really quite nice. So, um, let's see. We <clears throat> talked a bit about Zelda back half a year ago. Yeah. But we should talk about Zelda a little bit more. Have you Have you been playing Breath of the Wild a bit more? Uh, I kind of stopped playing that a little yeah. bit, but it, I still like remember it. When I did play it. When you go back, which Zelda game do you find you enjoy? Probably still Breath of the Wild. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So um, today, we're here we're, we're here for two days. You're here for two days. Yeah. You have a special guest over in your booth that I was lucky enough to interview a little bit as yeah. well. Who do you have over there? Uh, it's Walter Day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah, he's, uh, he's really known for a lot of things. There's been many documentaries that I've seen that he's been in. Yeah. It must be really special being able to work with him. Actually, my dad and somebody else is writing a book about him. Oh, really? Yeah. Fascinating. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, let's see here. As far as the event is going, uh, the day is going well for you. Did you guys set yeah. up yesterday? Uh, we actually uh, got came here this morning uh, oh, oh, to really? set up. Yeah. We, we had to show up yesterday to build all this stuff, but... Um, you came in around 8 o'clock or so, because I think everything started at 9. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it, it's a nice-looking booth over there, though, but the setup yeah. must have just been really quick. Yeah. It was it was pretty easy to set up. I see. It, is it different than any other booths that you've set up? Uh, not really. It's kind of the same, because uh, it's just easy. Say, I'm looking at this trading card here, Aiden Freeman. What is... Oh, I think that I have... Um, one of Walter Day's actual trading cards yes. that he's making these days in my hand. Correct. And this yes. one's for you. It's of you, 2820, Superstars of 2018, Aiden Freeman. Yeah. I will admit he told us that he'd make another Zelda podcast one too. I'm kind of excited about yeah. that. So what's going on here? What is, what's the deal with these these trading cards? They're pretty cool. Uh, so this card, uh, mine is, I, uh, the library is, I displayed um, all the cards that I have yeah. on uh, a display case in the uh, local library, and then it just became a card. That's Since, great. Yeah. That's cool. So, um, when it came to the Labo review that you did, uh, what were some of the things that got you excited about the about the game, about the product? Mainly, it's just the fact that you can actually play a game with no wiring, because there's no. Uh, it's like you literally just build it by yourself and then play a game. Did you find the setup to be? Difficult or easy, or was it? Uh, I think the it was it was really easy when yeah. I was building it. The mechanics, the di- the directions, uh, are really easy to follow. Because they do it right on the screen, isn't that right? Yeah. And you just kind of toggle through, and it shows 3D displays of it all. Yeah. Did you ever have an issue with the cardboard breaking? I've heard that happens for some people. Uh, not for me, but one time I put the sticker on wrong, and the game just messed up completely. So you had to restart, and then I like see. yeah. It was like a sensor sticker yeah. or something. Maybe it was reflective sticker. Yeah. Interesting. But but you were able to fix it? Yes, I was. How did that work? I just uh, took this I just replaced it, replaced the sticker. Pretty and me. then um, and then it was working well. I see. Fixed the sticker. Interesting, interesting. So what are what does your you know, here we are part of the, the we're starting to become part of the gaming industry and the retro collecting industry and yeah. stuff like that. I think it's very exciting. How do you feel about it all? Uh, it's just really cool to, like, you know, as a 13-year-old, just put my name out there. Uh, that's just what I've always wanted to do. When, probably when I get older, probably make it, like, a passion just to uh, work for the gaming industry. I love it. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Aiden, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Chat. Yeah. <laughs> Here you are, man. Thank you. Thank you. Can I keep the card? Oh, of course. Yes. Awesome. I have a lot more. I love it. So it was really nice to meet up with Aiden, and then right away we got Todd in the seat, and I chatted with him, and basically this will take us out to the end of the episode, except for that one little soundbite we have right at the end with the gentleman that that completed the game at the booth. Do you remember? that's right. I do remember. Yes. So that that was good. Yeah, yeah. He had kind of a cool outfit on. Hmm? But first, Todd Friedman. All right. I am here with my next guest, which is a returning guest. Todd Friedman, how are you? I'm very well, and I'm very excited that you're here at the Midwest Gaming Classic. Well, I must say we are as well. Um, Some of our listeners will recognize your voice from our Video Game Summit 2018 episode from last season. Correct. Uh, That was a very exciting experience for another Zelda podcast. We were just a little baby podcast back then, and we were very excited to um, have some space 
there. It was yeah. a wonderful event as as we dedicate a whole episode to it. Oh, My yeah. pleasure. I can't wait to come back for 2019. We already have our booth. Yep. We're we already have our uh, space Same ordered. spot as last year. Oh, I'm very, very excited. Yep. So it's so nice to bump into you, so to speak, in this yeah. other context here yeah. at the Midwest Gaming Classic. Yeah, this um, this event is, I've been, this is probably my 10th year coming to this event. Wow. Um, pretty much the first seven years or so, I was just a fan who came and, you know, was uh, interested in the gaming community. But in the last two or three years, I've been working for Old School Gamer and uh, Little Player Magazine was last year I was working for. So I've actually become more of a, I guess, an employee, I would say. It's more voluntarily, but... But yeah, part of the show. Yeah. Which is cool because, you know, you get these fancy little badges. You get to go behind the scenes as you have one. Yeah. I love it. Um, so to me, it's I, I prefer being a part of it than than the fan because it makes me happy to see everyone around here happy mm-hmm. and enjoying gaming and the different generations of people enjoying gaming from their grandparents, parents to kids. Um, so to me, it's it's just a great event. I tell you, we spoke to that point a little bit back in that episode for the VGS yeah. about how I think we spoke to, well, the, how the event is great for families, old, younger people. That's the thing that's interesting about retro games, if I may, is that it can pull kids and adults together. Yeah. If, if it's a brand, if it's like E3, fine, adults can still be interested in that. But with the retro stuff, there's something historic. It's There's a nice glue there, if I what, may. Well, what I, what I feel it is, is... Um, you know, people who grew up in the 80s, even the 70s, 80s, 90s, and they played video games, when they had children, they have something in common, like the video game world. Yeah. Yes, yeah. there's the difference PS4s and the Xboxes, but the adults have something to talk about with their children when they grew up. And so when the kids play the retro games, they realize that those are fun as well, and then they can, you know, play together. Um, I agree. Yeah. And we've, I've noticed something just today, and I, I noticed it a bit at the Video Game Summit, the younger kids don't mind playing old video games. Exactly. Well, this is how I feel. Like, nowadays, some of the controllers are very complex. Yeah. Um, Even PC gaming is very complex. And if you go back to the retro days where the controllers had one or two buttons, they were just up or down or left or right, I think it's it's good for most of the children because they could adapt to the games quicker. Yes, the graphics weren't like they were today, but I think that's what makes it as well... uh, in the eyes of children because they're it's new. It's, they've never seen things like that before. I agree. I mean, there's the obvious kind of pixel art trend that's happening that I think yeah. blurs that line even more for a kid who's playing a game that's 30 years old right. or playing Shovel Knight or something like that that's yeah. a, like newer that doesn't even look that much different. Exactly. Which is kind of cool. But I have, I have a five-year-old niece and a seven-year-old niece, and they've never once, I've had them play Nintendo 64 games, DS games, they've never once commented on the graphics. <laughs> and I guess, you know, maybe they're just not looking for it no, right now. I no. think there's such a spectrum, which I think is good. Yeah, it's just different. They don't know different what it was back then. It's new to them. So, yeah. you know, you compare the old Zelda to the Breath of the Wild. Yeah, they look completely different, but the stories and the characters are pretty much the same, and they can relate. So that's cool. Oh, yeah. So we did chat a little bit uh, in, in season one, you could say, about how nice it is to connect the generations. Mm-hmm. And I just want to say on a personal note, I feel like that conversation that we had on that episode kind of kicked something off with the Another Zelda podcast audience because oh. we started getting a bunch of reviews and tweets, people telling us, yes, we listen to the show with our kids and stuff. Oh, and cool. it was really cool. It started a little micro conversation oh, that's that great. seeded out of Video Game Summit. And I was really pleased about that. Yeah, and that really makes me happy because I... Uh, I don't know how to explain it. I, I like, like, you know, I, I earlier today I brought Walter over for you to, to meet and to be on your podcast. Yes. And to me, that's, it makes me feel really happy to get people from other communities together, bonding about gaming. And when I hear stories like you just told me about the kids and listening with their parents, it makes me really happy because I, it, to me, it's, it's really important for the families to get together. And gaming is one of the most popular things in the, in the world today, yep. you know, up with movies and music. I mean, so... Yep. So to me, those are, those stories really make me happy. It's a neat thing. I do feel that you and I are definitely on the same page with those kinds of thoughts. Yeah. So let's see. Um, let's have some fun and talk about Zelda stuff. Yeah. Now, obviously, we did favorite Zelda game and everything a year ago. Sure. I, I want to remix it a little bit. Actually, I've been watching streaming online with uh, with um, Link's Awakening. I think it is, or there's some. There's a lot of streaming online of the old N- Nintendo games of of Zelda, and it's really hot right now on Twitch. And I don't know if you've seen that community. I wonder it's. Be- and I'm wondering the ROMs why those, are really easy to run right now. Maybe. And I'm wondering why those games, yeah. I mean, you can go to Twitch and there's, you know, uh, uh, Ocarina of Time is on there yeah. and Link's Awakening and Four Swords. A lot of these games are streaming now. And people are watching it, which is cool. 
because I, yeah. it's not just online, you know, Fortnite stuff. It's the old Zeldas they're playing online. It's and it's really taken off. I don't know if you've caught on to that. I haven't. I've been. I haven't. I used to watch Twitch quite a bit. I used yeah. to have it kind of run in the background while sure. I worked on stuff. But this past year, with everything kind of growing, I've. I've. It's faded a bit. I'm yeah. gonna have to check this out. You do. Yeah. Just search any of the Zelda games from back in the '90s or even the '80s, like oh, the man. old original people. Oh, that's what I want to talk about. What's that? I saw a guy on Twitch. He's doing speed runs for the original Zelda. Okay. Now I don't know if you've watched that. It's fascinating because. <sighs> I never thought about speedrunning a Legend of Zelda game from, you know, <laughs> Nintendo. But, yeah. Yeah. but but it's, you know, you, you think of like Super Mario, you think of the old game Pac-Man, you know, just trying to get through the game fast. But people are going through the Legend of Zelda speedruns. And I was fascinated because they know secrets that I didn't know about the original game, and most likely you know of them. But there's ways to get more bombs, to get different doors open. Interesting. There's, there's, there's some parts where you bomb yourself to get you pushed through a secret wall. Yes. And I've seen things when, the, during, and this guy I've watched, I, I can't remember his name. You can maybe look it up but um, for your podcast, but he, he would speed run like a level in literally a minute and a half, like even level seven or eight. Oh my goodness. And to me, those are one of the hardest levels on Zelda, seven and eight, and he can just speed run right through them. And I'm going to have to check this out. you got to check it out. It's fascinating. Yeah. But I think well, my point was I'm, I'm very excited that those kind of games are in the new generation, like speed runs. Yeah, or, that or, is or interesting. Or online streaming. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, how it's come back around. I guess, well, I was speaking to Walter about this a little bit, when you can't, Zelda's not really a score game. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So maybe it does become about the different ways you can move through the game or something yeah. like that. Yeah, like I said, you got to check it out. It's hard to explain, but a speed run in Zelda is fascinating. I'm, I'm, this is going to be, it's, next time I'm just like working on graphics, yeah, I'm putting it up. Put it in the background. It's, it's amazing to watch. So you write for the Old School Gamer magazine, and of course the booth is here, which is very exciting. Yes. But I think you have some other projects going on too. We were chatting about it in the hallway just a bit. Yeah, so I've also become, just um, based on my experience and knowledge of the... Uh, gaming world, uh, been nominated to be the chairperson of the International Video Game Hall of Fame. Very cool. Um, I'm on the nomination committee. So basically what that means is um, I'm in charge of uh, a committee that is um, responsible for getting the public to vote on their favorite games or gamers of the last 40 years. And the International Video Game Hall of Fame, which uh, debuted in 2010 in Iowa, is uh, again coming back to uh, Otomo, Iowa. And it'll be in October. And nominations are online as we speak. You can go online and submit your favorite game. So being in the Zelda podcast, we we encourage people to vote for Zelda being into the Hall of Fame. I'll tell you what, yeah. Um, I, I do know that last year Breath of the Wild was in the Hall of Fame because of the current era game. I mean, it was back then it was kind of the... The, the best of the best. Yeah. Um, but the old school Zelda games, I just think, deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, I agree. There's a ton of them. So Full, full disclosure, this episode will come out about a month after we record, but I would yeah. love to include some links in our show notes and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. So if you go to ivgof.info, so it's I-V-G-H-O-F.info, it's the whole history of the International Video Game Hall of Fame. So when this does air, the nominations will be complete, but then you can go on and vote for your favorite top five people when we come out with the nominations. So so uh, hopefully Zelda will be there. I'm sure it will be. I will be voting for it. Awesome. But if we can get everyone to vote for Zelda, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll induct them in the Hall of Fame. And maybe we'll get you guys out there to do a podcast. I tell you what, we're just looking <laughs> for excuses. Them. We're yeah. just looking for excuses That'd be for episodes. That'd be very exciting. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I've, it's funny. I, I try to get myself involved in as many things as I can. I don't have time, obviously, for everything. I try to make time. But this Old School Gamer Magazine, the Hall of Fame, um, I also write for Retro Gaming Times, and the Video Game Summit are things that I'm really passionate about. Good way to spend good way to spend your days, if I may. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't do it for a career or a living. I do it for the goodness of my heart and making people happy. That's important to me. That's. I hope that's why most of us do it. I, I yeah. like it a lot. Yeah. Well, Todd, this was a pleasure seeing you again. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah. Just absolutely. It's. It's weird for me because, you know, I was so nervous at the video game summit meeting all of you and, yeah. and stuff, and now I'm feeling. I, even I'm feeling a little bit more. Well, you're part, part of the, of the family. Yeah, Just a little course. bit. Absolutely. It's a good feeling. And when I, I knew you were here, but I couldn't find you, and when I saw the sign, I go, Aiden, we got to come over here and go right to them because I was so happy to see your booth and it still looks amazing so we, we worked hard on this booth I'm yeah. very proud of it it's very and, good and that makes me feel great it, yeah. it makes me feel welcome and a part of the community so yeah. thank you very much you're very welcome and I've done a, a really uh, 
good service to, to promote your your podcast. I, I've I've spread the word. I put it on all my links. Wonderful. And I'm hoping. It, I, I just know this thing's going to be well the best. I'm I'm very very grateful indeed. And You're and hopefully we continue yeah. sharing back and forth with all the different things. Oh very yeah, excited. absolutely. Thank you so much. All right, cool man. Yeah. Thank all you. Right. Yep. Thanks for having me. So that was great. Todd's Todd's great. Oh, he's a cool guy. I enjoy I enjoy being his. Friend in the industry right. of game media. Yeah, you're kind of behind the scenes now with him. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Right, yes, indeed, indeed. And it'll be nice to reconnect with him at his convention, the yeah. Video Game Summit. Perfect. So um, we actually, I had my notes wrong here. We have one more. We have yeah, Gary, we have. who you spoke oh, to. Man, we got some hot takes coming your way, why baby. You, why don't you set this up? Because we're almost done with this episode. Well, I babble on incessantly in the actual recording, but I'll, I'll keep it brief here and say that this guy has a particular take on The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild. All right, Alex again here at the Midwest Gaming Classic. And uh, we've been talking about a lot of things, all Zelda. We've been talking about your favorite links. We've been talking about your favorite, uh, your favorite timelines, your favorite uh, non-canonical links, your, your what have you. But now we have a treat for you listeners. We managed to find the only person in the convention center who hates The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild for the Switch and Wii U. And uh, I'm going to allow him to take it away. His name's Gary. He's uh, He's got some panels here this weekend, but he he took uh, time out of his busy schedule to be bumped twice and then finally make it onto the podcast. Gary, how are you? I am tired. My voice is hanging in there, which is a good thing. Uh, but I am enjoying having fun with hobbies here uh, as far as just a celebration of everything gaming except Breath of the Wild. <laughs> You know what? One thing Shots I'm gonna fired. I'm gonna steal the phrase "having fun with hobbies." I think that is great and a great way to sum up what conventions are. Um, so, Breath of the Wild. Why do you hate it? Why Why do you insist on being so wrong? <laughs> not wrong. <laughs> First of all, it's not a Zelda game. It is completely and totally Minecraft in the Zelda universe. Yeah, but Zelda's in it. Uh, and <laughs> so, so here's honestly where, and I, and I honestly think part of my issue with the game is the way that it's designed and where some modern gaming has gone. Sure. My favorite Zeldas of all time, I love Link to the Past. I think it's a masterpiece. Um, the original one I think is great too. I'm actually one of the few people, I like Twilight Princess. And I know You're talking to two people whose Twilight Princess is in their top three. Yeah, I mean, a Twilight Princess, I think, is a really... I'm, okay. It's for not people only who do like I to like, read. Not only do I like Twilight Princess, I like Twilight Princess on the Wii, <laughs> which nobody <laughs> likes. Um, so so here's, here's what I look at Breath of the Wild as, is the fact that a lot of people early on... Oh, you can speed run it. You can beat it in a couple hours. Okay. I don't care about beating a game. I want to complete a game. So I don't care about, I don't want to go and just beat the end boss and be done with it. I want to enjoy the journey. And for me, Breath of the Wild, have you seen Clerks 2? I have. Okay. So Randall, who was in Clerks 2. First of all, I have to agree, there is only one return. It's not of the king, it's of the Jedi. (laughs) Also not a a Ray fan, by the way. Um, But what I will say is he, he talked about Lord of the Rings and the fact that even the trees in that movie walked and meandered. And I felt in Breath of the Wild, until you get the horses, that's all you do. Mm. I can get past the weapons breaking. Uh, it For me, it is too much of an open world. I like you have to beat boss A. Boss, it's the Mega Man format. Right, sure, of course. Where you get you beat this boss, it ha- or you, you go into this dungeon, you get this weapon, helps you beat that boss. Interesting. So on and so forth. So the one thing that I... I criticized about the series until Breath of the Wild was that there was too much of that. There was too much of single-use weapons. You would use them in one dungeon, and then you were done with it. And but they, you also had other weapons if you look like, the again, looking at Link to the Past, the right. shot. Yes. You know, it's one of those where, yeah, it can help you get past you know, sure. gaps and whatnot, but it becomes a really valuable weapon, I would say, even more so than the boomerang, just because of the versatility. That yeah. it, it cannot, it doesn't stun, it actually attacks and damages. Yes. You can retrieve uh, not just weapons, but uh, rupees and hearts and whatnot, and you can also cross caverns. So I think that's one of those where. They allowed you to think outside the box with how you wanted to utilize and it. And certainly one of the more important weapons in Gerudo Fortress and Ocarina of Time. Right. Because like you said, you're not just, you know, you can't run out of arrows. You you can use it to attack or knock out the Gerudo Warriors at any point. So what I will say about Breath of the Wild is um, I think that it is, it's a good foundation and a good engine for a potentially good Zelda game. If, if you make it a little more linear, 
if if you make it so like the uh, divine beasts meant something that right. they weren't just like a half baked puzzle. Um, it's a beautiful game. It's it's stunning, and and the score is the score amazing. is amazing. I, I do love the uh, the inventory system where it, it you can break down weapons and things. What I will say is. They didn't go far enough with it. There's games like Witcher 3 where you have an inventory system that breaks as well, but you have the opportunity to fix it. Mm -hmm. And if even if they just took that step in Breath of the Wild, I think it would have been way more effective because what ha what ended up happening is I was afraid of breaking this cool new weapon, so, so I never used it. it. Exactly. So I, I would almost say if you look at a you know, completely different type of game, but look at Resident Evil 4. Sure. The way you could combine, you know, because with in in Breath of the Wild you have the the cooking and the crafting which I was not a fan of, but in Resident Evil, you had a way where if you combined A plus B and you got C, yep. it actually had a definitive use sure. versus, okay, you can eat this and it will actually make you sicker instead of better. Right? Right. It was it was a waste of time, both in the, the crafting aspect and the utilization. I will say, um, in my first run through Breath of the Wild on normal mode, the only time I really crafted anything was before I got any clothing that would keep me warm. I cooked some peppers and right. that kept me warm and you had to do that I think, but past that I didn't really cook anything. Now I'm, I'm running through master mode right now very slowly because I'm bad at it, but uh, I found that I have to craft things just so I have enough hearts to not get right. one-shotted all the time. So if you expanded that and you made it a little bit more linear and you added actual dungeons, I think you'd have a really good Zelda game. Well, and here's here's the thing that I look at with Breath of the Wild. They were so busy thinking about, and I'm going to quote Jeff Goldblum here. They were so busy thinking and wondering if they could. They never stopped to think if they should. Um, <laughs> they stood my, on the shoulders of geniuses. And yes. Uh, I mean, my my Breath of the Wild story, I bought it at launch with the system, of course, like, like we all did. Mm -hmm. And I played about 40 hours, and I think I had six or seven hard containers. I felt completely like I'm wasting my time doing this. Sure. I'm breaking weapons. I'm sliding down as the rain falls and everything. And it just, I got frustrated with it. And then right before Christmas of launch year, my system died on me. Ugh. So I descended into Nintendo. And as you know, back then we didn't have cloud saves. Nope. So I lost everything. Oh, I haven't picked man. the game up since. That's a hard one. I, I feel you there. There's um there's been times I've, I've several playthroughs of Link to the Past and a several playthroughs of Twilight Princess. I've gotten two thirds of the way through the game and then for whatever reason put it down for more than a day or two and it's so hard to get back into a game right. like that. And even more so with Breath of the Wild because it takes so long to max out your stamina or max out your hearts and the game just becomes way more enjoyable when you have that. Before you have that, it's tough. You got to be excited about the game in general to slog through all that stuff in the beginning. Well, and here's something I would say is if you look at, you know, the the next epic game that came out from Nintendo for the Switch, which was Mario Odyssey. Yeah. That to me was a beautiful way to incorporate an open world, but you also had that somewhat linear progression yeah. where it made sense that you had to go and you had to, you know, capture so many moons so that you could unlock this and then you could get this this outfit so yep. that you could beat this boss. There was a natural progression to it, whereas this, I mean, the the temples I thought were were useless. I mean, it was, it was, yeah. it was a puzzle. It was a dressed up puzzle, right? And and I know I'm I. You guys are gonna get so flamed over this. Well, we won't. Well, <laughs> you will. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think I agree with you there. The distinction between Mario Odyssey and uh, Breath of the Wild is, you would almost accidentally. Mario Odyssey was good. I loved them both. I'll say that. Mario Odyssey, um, the puzzle was getting to the Power Moon, where Breath of the Wild, you almost accidentally wandered into the shrines. Right. And then once you were in the shrine, once you accidentally found the shrine, sometimes they were puzzles, sometimes they weren't. But I think Mario Odyssey, like you said, does a great job of sandboxing it enough so you have a linear progression in the main arc of the game, but then also wide enough and open enough where... You could find tiny little mini puzzles. They're almost like it's almost like a, an abstraction of Mario Party, where you have the mini right. games within each level. Um, well, and like I say too, like where where I think people got got caught up on beating the game versus completing it and and enjoying the experience. I look at guys like Mike Matei from Cinemassacre. Sure, the dude is brilliant at. I mean, we've got the original Zelda playing behind us. He's beaten the game. He's done playthroughs on the second without the sword. Right. It's crazy because it's just epic. But that's one of those where he still has to go through the progression to go through and get the different yeah. pieces of the Triforce to be able to do that. Well, I think with the earlier games, too, it was way, way harder to beat the 
you know, actually all games until Breath of the Wild, they force you to get all the weapons. Like, you could, you can get through Zelda without getting, like, the original sword or the Master Sword and right. the Golden Arrows, but, like... There was more of really a challenge kinda, yeah, yeah. versus, like, I found a way to cheat and get through and, and cut 40 hours out of this game. You know, yeah. I, I look at... You can beat the original Zelda in, what, four hours or less? Yeah, with for, a for an average and, user. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, and Link to the Past, I'd say that's a 10 to 20 hour, depending, again, on the skill of the user. Yep. I mean, if I'm just getting started 20 hours in, and I'm still kind of learning the... I, that's that, a tall order. That is too... I, I've got two kids. I've got a right. family. I work a full-time job. I'm a part-time YouTuber. Ain't nobody got time for that. Now, you say you do love Twilight Princess. I did. And the first hour of that is like all text boxes and but spamming A. But that's an hour versus 20 to 30. That's, that's uh, Okay. You make and a good point. context is king. That is true. So, I mean, that's one of those things where you, you need to... I, I don't mind having that helping hand initially, but it doesn't need to be hours upon hours upon yes. hours because if... <laughs> in my previous careers, I have been asked to create tutorials for how to use websites. Sure. If your website needs a tutorial, it is not intuitive you need to enough. The website. If you need 10 to 20 hours of tutorial to teach players how to play your game, you need to rethink how you're making your game. You know, the longer we talk, and I want... I'm, gonna... I'm not wrong. I may not be right, but I am not wrong here. You don't... No, you make, a, you make a compelling case, and I think if we talk for another couple hours, I'll end up hating Breath of the Wild, too. Well, and here's the thing. <laughs> I don't want others to not enjoy the game. If you love the game, you know what? That's terrific. I am, I'm one of the weird people. I don't care for the N64 Zelda games. I just don't. Interesting. So I will say this to address that point. Um, this is a little tangential, but I think like even the games that I don't like in the franchise, uh, I'll still buy and I'll play through because it means that they're fundraising for the next game, which might be my next favorite Zelda game. Right. So even if I don't like the Breath of the Wild, even uh, even if I don't like an Ocarina of Time, they're still like the main titles in the franchise that are going to pay for the the um, the ports of Link to the Past or the refresh of Link's Awakening. Yeah, that, that's going to be awesome. Enjoy. Oh, I know it's going to be so great. I mean, but but like I say, it's one of those where in uh, we get hung up. We being commentators, gamers, whatever you want to call us. I don't like it, so nobody else should either. Right. No, no, if, come if on. If you yeah. like, no, I'm sure that you've seen yeah. on forums and Facebook and Twitter, and it's, it's it's stupid. You know what? If you love Breath of the Wild, more power to you. Absolutely. It's just not. It's like people who don't like Fortnite. There you go. <laughs> it is. As long as you're playing and enjoying what you like to play and enjoy, the hobby's just going to grow. It's going to get better, and you pass on what you love to those. I love it. Well, let's end it there. Gary, it's been great talking to you. Do you have anything you want to plug? I do. So, first off, if you want to follow me on YouTube, it is Rock Solid Productions, R-O-X-O-L-I-D. So, YouTube.com slash Rock Solid Productions. Um, great talking to you. Uh, good luck at your panels at the con. We try to keep this evergreen and not tied to any one position in time, much like the Zelda series. But, you know, sometimes you got to spill the beans. We're at the Midwest Gaming Classic. We and, are. And uh, stay tuned for more. And I got to say this, you know, before we get out of here, for the folks here in Wisconsin, yep, go Brewers. Go Brewers, baby. I mean, honestly, Alex, that was I, Gary was a very nice guy, and he made nice points. It was hard for me to hear some of that. Yeah, no, it was. Um, he he spoke well. He defended his position. He didn't back down. But I gotta tell you, <laughs> he's dead wrong. Oh, oh, I will fight him on this. Wow. Well, you were certainly under his spell in the interview. Well, listen, I don't know what he did. He was doing <laughs> something. He had some of those crazy eyes going with the pinwheels. Yep. I could see his position. I could see his point. And I think in today's political yeah. climate, it's important to see the position. Because if we're ever going to change hearts and minds of people we don't agree with, we have to see him as human first. But I will tell you, Gary, I will find you. <laughs> and I will tell you, you are dead wrong. <laughs> that game is a masterpiece. Um, but that but he, <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. You're going. You're going. You've got a whole thing happening here. Well, no. I, I, <laughs> I'm i backtracking not only on what I said with Gary, but what I said earlier in the episode as well. That I think it would be... A perfect game if there were more dungeons, more puzzles. But it's beautiful, Dave. Yeah, I think it's a good game. I think it's wonderful as well. We'll see. I can. I always end that by saying we'll see what happens in the sequel. I hope only good things. So last but not least, we had a gentleman who for a, for a couple hours ended up playing the uh, the Legend of Zelda on our at our booth, the original on one of our TVs, the original The Legend of Zelda, and. He, he was playing and playing, and I didn't pay too much attention. I started noticing he was getting a bunch of items, and started noticing he was getting items before going to dungeons. And you and I were chatting about some other stuff, and we'd kind of look up on the big screen. And slowly but surely, over the course of the afternoon, both of us noticed, like, this guy's... He's going for it. This guy's playing the game. Yeah. This guy's going from start to finish, and he knows what he's doing. 
he got you know he got the magical sword before he even went to like the first dungeon or something like that. Like this guy has a plan. Mm-hmm. So we started paying attention, and lo and behold, by the by the time that by towards the end of the evening, um, Juan Torres ended up beating the Legend of Zelda right there, right there on the spot. Start no game to over. It was no close game. in the in the last dungeon. He um, yeah, level right. nine, I think. Right, like he uh, he had to end up using the red potion prematurely. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. Soon, earlier than he wanted to, for sure. There was definitely some drama there. There was some drama. And so he got to it. And actually, uh, Scott and Chris and a few other folks were kind of hanging out watching the end right. of it. And uh, so real quick, I just said, Juan, he was he was a, a, a perfect gentleman, uh, but but a, a slightly quieter gentleman. And I said, Juan, Juan, please come get on the mic. I want to talk to you about this. And I do think he was he he, he performed very well on the, with the video game, but I think he was just a touch nervous. But still, sure. at least we chatted a little bit. So I'll pull up uh, my my quick conversation with Juan here. Okay. Okay. I am here with a another guest of the booth, and actually, I don't even know your name yet. What? Who? Who are you? Juan Torres. <laughs> Juan Torres. Yes. Juan. Um, it's actually been pretty exciting the last hour or so. You just very politely stepped up to our booth, asked if uh, I could reset the uh, le- the original The Legend of Zelda, and you've just played through the entire game with like full items and everything, and we, uh, that was very exciting to see. You clearly had a plan. Have you, you played this game a lot? Oh, yeah. I played it a lot. <laughs> that, that's cool. Did you, do you speed run it, or how did, when did you start I playing The Legend of Zelda? It. I just wanted to, like, pretty much get a start, just grab what I can be able to get without getting the items in the dungeons first, and then I start the dungeons right away. I see. Now, I noticed you went for all the items first. A lot of people do use that as a strategy. Yes. Obviously, you think that's important. I mean, I, I agree, but why is that important in your sake? Makes the dungeons go by quicker. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it did get a little sketchy there right at the end. I was getting a little nervous for you. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you been practicing playing The Legend of Zelda? Uh, I haven't played the, the first one in a while, so it's just, I just know everything by heart. I see. I see. That's very cool. It's very exciting. Um, do you have any other Zelda games that are kind of your favorites? Well, let's see here. So much to pick. I don't know which one's the best. Well, the best one I know is Breath of the Wild. I do enjoy that one very much myself. I feel like it's Breath of the Wild and the original are kind of my two favorites. If only they turn it into a co-op. That would be cool. Because it's it is. They say it's bigger than Skyrim, but which is true. Yes, I've like, seen then that. Why, why is it one player? Can it be multiplayer at least? Maybe that. Maybe the sequel. The sequel apparently is going to use the same engine, so maybe they could just like figure that out. Oh, hope so. That would be cool. Awesome. Well, we don't have to chat too much. Have you been playing games for a long time? Do you like to speedrun other games, or do you? I can speedrun Super Mario Bros. That's cool. Do you have a, an account or any information where we can find you? You have Instagram, right? Yes, I do. Do you mind telling us what it is? Well, I think it's Juan Torres 1985. Juan Torres 1995. Yeah, I was born in '85, so yeah. No, actually, it's Juan Torres 2018. 2018. Cool. Yeah, it's right here. Excellent, Juan. That'll be fun to follow you. <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, so how, how has the Midwest gaming experience been for you so far? Awesome. It's my third year. Third year coming. Yes. It's our first year being here. We're very excited to oh, be nice. here. Um, any 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 good pickups that you've been looking for or finding? Well, I did buy one thing for now. It's yeah. my book bag. Oh, this is great. Mario Brothers book bag. I see it. I still have it. Oh, it's in the book bag. I see. <laughs> this is all I bought for now. Cooking Kirby? Yep. I love it. Cafe Kirby. Cafe Kirby? Yeah. That's great, dude. Well, we were happy to have you here as company, and uh, it was very exciting to see you finish the game off there. Usually when we have these things out, people you know, they poke around for 10, 5, five 10 minutes or something like that. It was fun to see someone. Is there any anime cons you guys go to? Or Not conventions? yet. Okay. Not yet. We've only, we go to the Video Game Summit in Chicago, and then now we've come here. and that's, that's Wisconsin really... Wisconsin Comic Convention? We could try it. That's we in haven't June. Yet. Oh, yeah? Yeah. We should look the, out. It's actually it's here, actually. Oh, really? Yes. Interesting. We'll have to take a look for it. In the meantime, it'll be fun to, to see you online. Oh, yeah, definitely. So thank you very much for just giving me a couple minutes here to, to, to uh, talk about you playing the game. Awesome. It was fun to watch. Yeah. All right. All right, cool, man. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. So I mean that was I mean that was nice to just see him more, more was the experience of him hanging out at the booth with us which was really great yeah and uh, Juan thank you so much for for treating us to seeing the entire The Legend of Zelda played at our booth and uh, was he carrying around a Togepi was that what he was carrying around I, ho- I hope your Togepi is doing well he had a couple he had he had a, a a selected outfit I mean I wouldn't say it was a costume but he had like a cool look going on he had like a, the plush uh, Pokemon though oh yeah 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 I think you're right I think yeah, you're right that was nice so with all that said Alex that took us to the end of the night. We uh, 
we put all of the fabric on the, you know, they had mm-hmm. a rule there where you have to put fabric on the items in your booth, which right. makes a lot of sense because most of the time, most of the people were vendors, so they're putting this fabric over their games. And what that does is that triggers to security. If there's fabric over your booth, no one should be in that booth, so security kind of knows to look. And uh, we ended up actually meeting up with Max and Jordan real we quick sure did. for a little bit of food and drinks. Had some tapas. I drove all over Milwaukee by accident. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. This episode's been going so long. I'd love to tell that story as well. But Alex, let's wrap this up. Um, it was a great, it was a wonderful experience. You were there on Sunday. Mm-hmm. There are some other stories to tell on Sunday, but I'll, I'll allow my nieces to tell some of those stories on yeah. our next episode. I think that'll be a lot of fun. Of course. And so, of course, thank you to you for, for giving Another Zelda podcast your weekend because you're, you are part of the Another Zelda podcast family in that you... Our, uh, I kind of asked you to be one of our managers on our Discord channel. And, and uh, so you're on Discord at Ocarina of Rhyme. Uh, yep, I threw it over to you, but I'll take it. I was wondering what you were asking me uh, at no Discord. Yes, that's right. I'm at Discord. <laughs> you're at Ocarina of, of Rhyme over yes. on Discord if people want to chat with you a little bit more mm-hmm. about certain things. And uh, it's kind of nice, too, because I know that you'll dip in there and kind of give me... I'm usually really busy with production and stuff, and I try to get in as much as I can. More notifications. Um, <laughs> these are actually... This is another Zelda podcast blog people texting me right now as we're recording. I'm so happy to chat with them after this. This is all happening right now. This is all happening on air in real <laughs> time alex we're trying to end this episode Dave, you have a deadline to, you got to get out of here you got a you got a uh, hard four i have a well, i have a hard out at four which it is four right oh, now i don't and know it, what the lingo is i have a 4 30 over uh, over in logan square okay coming up next well let, let's get you out of here mm-hmm. i had mm-hmm. a great time thank you for having me both at the con both on this show and with the other interviews that we did during the day uh your nieces are gonna do great <laughs> they, they're 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 pros. They've got it. I think no it'll be problem. fun. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm going to yeah. put them both on the mic at the same time. I think. Dave, I think where we'll can we find you mic. on the internet? So I am on the internet at Raptor Paint on Discord, Instagram, and Twitter. Alex, where can people find you? I am Works on My Machine. No O in Works. That's on Twitter, on Instagram, and you can email me alexmsheehan at gmail.com if you want. Marvelous, marvelous. Uh, people can find the show at Another Zelda Pod on Twitter and Another Zelda Podcast on Instagram. Of course, you can find us on Facebook and YouTube just by searching Another Zelda Podcast or go to our website, anotherzeldapodcast.com, where you can find show notes to all of our episodes, but also we now have blog posts that are going up there. Actually, as of this recording today, the reason I'm getting messages right now is as of today, our fourth post just posted by oh. Mr. Shane, Shane Kelly. Uh, it's called The Sound of Silence or The Silence of Link. I don't know. I haven't seen the notes yet. It's just going live right now. Celeste Roberts is making it go live right now. And so it's really cool to have this team grow and build anotherzeldapodcast.com. You can find all the stuff there. Alex, thank okay. you. I'll see you. I'll see you soon. I'll see you for some 6-5 stuff. Oh, next week we have yep. a 6-5 meeting. Sure do. And uh, I'll always try to find another excuse to get you back on Another Zelda Podcast. And I'll always find an excuse to ruin it for you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Alex. We'll see you later, man. Bye.